Good morning. Welcome to the Congressional uh, Service Center, Visitor Center, excuse me. Uh, I want to apologize in advance. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlanta Council. I apologize for our cramped quarters. And for those of you who have to stand, this is an important event, so we have lots of people who want to attend, and we only have a relatively limited space, which you see and which you are part of. Uh, this is a wonderful event about U.S. strategic interests in Ukraine. This is a conference which is 100% about American policy and not at all about politics. And to underscore that, we have 10 Washington think tanks across the spectrum who are participating today. Uh, the American Foreign Policy Council, the Brookings Institution, the Carnegie Endowment, Heritage Foundation, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the German Marshall Fund, the Jamestown Foundation, and of course the Atlantic Council. And we are co-sponsored by Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur and Congressman Fitzpatrick. Uh, and I thank them very much for hosting us today. And the panel we're about to have will include uh, both of them, and we hope Congressman Andy Harris, who I believe will be here shortly. Um, I am known for my very short introductions, and I'll keep it um, here. Um, Congressman Kaptur has been in Congress since 1983 and a real leader on foreign policy issues relating to Ukraine and Eastern Europe more broadly. Congressman Fitzpatrick has been in the House since 2017, and he has made himself a strong voice also on issues relating to Ukraine, Russia, and Eastern Europe. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Congressman Kaptur.
Good morning, and thank you all for coming today on behalf of the Congressional Ukraine Caucus, Ambassador Herbs, thank you so very much, and all of you, uh, for helping to organize this open forum to highlight U.S. strategic interest in Ukraine. I want to thank the Atlantic Council, uh, Shirley Ambassador Herbst, Melinda Herring, and Shelby Maggot for so ably convening this event. We apologize. The attendance is so extraordinary. We don't have enough chairs for everyone. I cede my chair to whoever feels comfortable to sit there. I also welcome foreign policy experts from uh, 10 think tanks representing such diverse interests and points of view, yet we are united by a commitment to ensure a free, secure, and prosperous Ukraine among the community of democratic nations. We know the objective. It is no secret that Ukraine dominates the news cycle and the domestic debate, and I'm so thrilled to have our co-chair, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, with us today as well on a bipartisan basis. We hold this forum uh, as uh, other committees in this Congress are involved in uh, related proceedings. Yet despite the ongoing debate, Russia continues to wage an illegal war in Ukraine, which has led to the deaths of upwards of 14,000 Ukrainians and displacement of millions more. The American people need to know and be reminded why Ukraine is so important and why the Ukrainian people are sacrificing for liberty and why Ukraine matters to the security of liber liberty-loving nations. The purpose of this event is not to discuss dis domestic politics, but rather to signal resolute, bipartisan, bicameral support for Ukraine. We must also use this opportunity to conceive new legislative and policy proposals. Uh, Ukraine, in my opinion, is a scrimmage line for liberty on the European continent. She is facing off against Russian aggression that seeks to undermine and sow discord in the greatest collective security arrangement of democratic nations, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And thanks to NATO and other multilateral institutions such as the European Union, Europe has enjoyed unprecedented levels of peace and prosperity. Americans, too, have benefited from their sacrifice and from the peace in Europe that followed World War II including enhanced economic, cultural, and political exchanges. Perhaps most importantly, the United States has not been forced to send her sons and daughters to fight against tyranny in Europe. It has come at a price, and the American people have paid it. Meanwhile, in the face of increasing Russian aggression, Ukraine continues to make strides in its democratic struggle to shake off the rapacious grip of its oligarch class. This past year, President Zelensky and the Servant of People Party won the presidential and parliamentary elections with a clear mandate for democratic reform. The Ukrainian people made their voices known. They want to live among the community of democracies free from Russian invasion and aggression. Ukraine set up the long-awaited special anti-corruption court, and we look forward to the first case being heard. Ukraine is also so important because it is the pathway to democracy in adjoining nations, surely Russia. So it is critical that bipartisan support for U.S. assistance to Ukraine remain robust to deter Russian aggression, as well as to support President Zelensky's democratic agenda. Since Ukraine's independence, Congress has led the charge in supporting Ukraine's democratic trajectory. And we must, as Congress, speak with one voice to ensure that that message remains clear. For example, the Open World Leadership Center, an instrumentality of the Library of Congress, is a critical one to boost congressional diplomacy and exchange with Democratic friends in Ukraine. Earlier before Thanksgiving, our bipartisan caucus had the honor of welcoming four very new, talented members of Ukrainian parliament, and we must also provide robust uh, exchanges and support for Ukraine's veterans who are defending their nation against Russian aggression as we sit here today. We must also continue to increase our business opportunities for Ukrainian 
uh, business leaders, and even for Ukraine's real women who are feeding their nation, feeding their families, their neighbors, even walking among the landmines in the eastern part of the country. Imagine the courage and resolve that takes. We must bolster our own anti-corruption programming to break the grip of Ukraine's rapacious oligarch caste to unleash, for the first time in modern history, the full power of Ukraine's people. Once again, I want to thank you all for coming to this very timely and important event to demonstrate robust bipartisan support for Ukraine. And together with the Ukrainian people, I know we will be successful in ensuring a more democratic and prosperous Ukraine among Western nations. You have all been a part of forming this new agenda for a part of the world long locked behind the Iron Curtain Thank you for understanding what liberty requires. It's an honor to be among you today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Marcy, thank you. It's good to be with you, Andy. Um, and we wanted to host today's event um, really to accomplish a couple things. Number one, to make it abundantly clear that uh, our caucus and our Congress stand solidly behind Ukraine and the U.S.-Ukraine relationship. That is very, very important. Um, you know, Marcy and I have been, have been working on this for, for quite some time now as far as our work in the caucus, uh, connecting with members of the RADA um, from Ukraine uh, who are part of the American caucus uh, in Ukraine. And obviously we all have our own desires um, as far as what we're seeking to advance uh, as far as U.S.-Ukraine relations. Um, my uh, connection to Ukraine, obviously we have a significant uh, Ukrainian American population in my district. Uh, also my last international FBI assignment as an FBI agent uh, was serving uh, in Ukraine, helping them establish the NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau. And during those efforts and traveling that country, um, you could not help but be impressed and be inspired by the spirit of the Ukrainian people and their desire for strong uh, ties with the West and their desire, particularly among the, the younger generation, which are a very, very inspiring group of people, to rid uh, Ukraine of corruption, systemic corruption, which has gripped that nation for a long time. The NABU was part of the, that effort. Uh, Marcy mentioned the anti-corruption court, a very, very significant step in that effort. And also that we are uh, uh, advancing legislation here in addition to uh, financial support, in addition to uh, military intelligence sharing, which is very, very important to support uh, Ukraine's um, efforts to, to push back against invasion uh, in, the, in the Donbass region, but also refusing to recognize the annexation, the illegal annexation of Crimea. And we have legislation on that. Myself and Brendan Boyle um, worked very, very hard on the U.S.-Ukraine Cybersecurity Cooperation Act. It was something that we saw up, in, uh, up close uh, and, and very present during my time in Kiev when there were multiple attempts by Russia to knock out Ukraine's electrical grid. Uh, the cyber threats that Ukraine is under is very, very significant, uh, and they need help in combating that. So I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, one of the uh, goals of our caucus, and I've tried to help Ukraine in, in multiple ways, both in my role on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, serving on the subcommittee for Europe and Eurasia, serving as a commissioner on the Helsinki Commission, uh, and also as the co-chair of the Ukraine caucus. Uh, our challenge has always been to elevate the level of this conversation to let everybody know with all the other issues we're dealing with here in Congress that this relationship is very, very important. It's important not just to Ukraine, it's very important to the United States. It's important to the region, it's important to national security for both countries and all freedom-loving countries. And we stand unified behind that relationship. We will make it grow, we will make it stronger, and it's got bipartisan support, and I think it's very, very important that everybody understand that loud and clear. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for inviting us. God bless. Thank you very much. I'm Congressman Andy Harris from uh, Maryland and uh, one of the co-chairs of the Ukraine Caucus. And, uh, you know, my colleagues have already said a lot. Uh, uh, my interest in Ukraine is I'm a first-generation American. My mother, uh, ethnic Ukrainian, born in, uh, in Poland, uh, in Galicia. So uh, as, in that part of the world, uh, as Americans sometimes don't understand, uh, boundaries change, but uh, ethnicities don't. Uh, and it creates conflict uh, at times, including the conflicts we see now uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I, I just want to add you know, my, uh, my voice to the bipartisanship that is so obvious on this issue. 
And uh, it's an interesting day in Washington. This is not the only hearing occurring uh, at the time. But this is one where Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, stand together uh, to show the importance, the strategic importance, as you will hear from the panels, of, you know, of, uh, of the Ukraine. Obviously a flashpoint in the world, and uh, the United States uh, is taking a leadership position in uh, making sure that, uh, that liberty, freedom, and democracy are established and preserved uh, in, in Ukraine as it makes, as it makes its latest efforts uh, to emerge, as uh, Ms. Kaptur said, from behind the Iron Curtain. So it's a pleasure uh, to, uh, to be here and to, uh, to help host the conference with my, uh, with my uh, co-chairs of the Ukrainian Caucus. And uh, I'm glad to see a packed room of interest uh, for what is a very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you for your interest in Ukraine. Um, uh, to begin, I want to one more time make sure that you uh, are here for the right reasons. Uh, uh, I want to emphasize that this is this discussion about Ukraine and about uh, why does Ukraine matter to United States, and it's not about impeachment or uh, discussion of uh, such matter. Um, uh, despite the fact that Ukraine uh, is. Uh, uh, source of much breaking news these days. Uh, so my name is Miroslava Gungadze. I lead Ukrainian service for Voice of America, and uh, I am honored to introduce our panel today. Uh, Leon Aron, a resident scholar, director of Russian Studies, American Enterprise Institute, to my right. Uh, Ilan Berman, a senior vice president, American Foreign Policy Council, to my right. Heather Conley, uh, Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and uh, Arctic, Director, Europe Program, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Ambassador Herbst, uh, John Herbst, the Director, Eurasia Center, Atlantic Council. And uh, Dr. Donald Johnson, uh, Editor-in-Chief, Senior Fellow, Center for European uh, Policy Analysis. Before we begin, um, I would, uh, one household matter, uh, this panel is designed as a discussion and does not permit questions from the audience. I would like uh, my colleagues to speak not more than three minutes. Uh, and um, uh, after the first round of questions, I would like you to feel free engaged, uh, freely engaged in a discussion. Uh, if a new member of Congress or senators will come uh, to our room, we will stop the panel, we'll let them, uh, we'll let them speak. So uh, let's start. Next week in Paris, uh, there will be a meeting of Normandy format negotiation. Leaders of Ukraine, Russia, uh, France and Germany uh, could make a decision that uh, actually can impact the future of not only Ukraine, but Europe for uh, years to come. We will talk about it in length uh, later. However, I would like to start um, uh, with remind you a couple of um, a few historic dates uh, from this week this, um, uh, that impacted uh, today's U.S.-Ukraine-European relations. On December 1st, 28 years ago, Ukraine voted uh, to win its independence. On December 8, 20 years ago, 28 years ago, the Soviet Union was dismantled. On December 6, 25 years ago, Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum and gave up its nuclear weapons. So uh, I would like to uh, start from that 30 years ago, because I think we have to learn uh, from history to understand today. Berlin Wall collapsed. The Warsaw Pact crumbled, and both Soviet, last Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and Russian president, first president Boris Yeltsin, thought that they could reshape the Soviet Union. They clearly underestimated Ukraine's and other countries' desire for independence. On the other side of the ocean, the George W. Bush administration seems to share its Moscow misconception. The infamous Chicken Kiev speech showed their lack of understanding of the region and its people. 
I will start with Leon Aaron. Why do you think this misconception occurred? And how did it shape US policy going forward? And does this misconception uh, still uh, in this, do we have this misconception still? Thanks very much, Miroslava. Um, before we get to misconceptions, um, I wonder if I could um, um, start by answering the question directly. Um, uh, that's uh, our panel's question. Mm -hmm. Why Ukraine matters? And then we can come to that. Um, Ukraine matters because it's a critical uh, test case. And it's a critical test case um, in two respects. One, uh, because it tests the ability of, of the West to um, oppose what appears to be um, uh, the, the current predominant doctrine um, in uh, Russia, which is that uh, former Soviet republics, um, with the exception of the Baltics, are in the sphere of uh, interests of Russia. And therefore, Russia has the right um, to arrest their um, uh, orientation. Um, foreign policy, defense orientation, as it pleases. Um, so the test case of Ukraine is whether the West could oppose this doctrine. The second, I think, is an, an even more important case, uh, uh, test case for Ukraine, is that um, it, you know, put it in a very blunt terms, it tests um, the West's ability to punish aggression um, instead of eventually recognizing uh, um, uh, or, or granting or deeding uh, the fruits of that aggression to the aggressor um, and uh, thus rewarding the aggression. Um, one of the things, Miroslava, that, that um, uh, of course is very troubling because of the historic um, uh, parallels and historic echoes is uh, something we hear a lot um, in the West, including um, in this town, which is that so long as we grant uh, Putin um, uh, uh, um, uh, Donbass, mm -hmm. so long as we settle something somehow, and of course, you know, the, the, the question of the border, the question of the disarming of the, um, of the rebels, the question of um, uh, elections, um, and, and most importantly, the withdrawal of foreign troops from uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. So long as that somehow is solved, um, um, there will be peace, and um, Vladimir Putin and, he, and Russia will be satisfied. Um, let me conclude by saying that I don't think that's the case. I think for both deeply held ideological reasons and the reasons of domestic, uh, uh, his domestic political imperatives, uh, Vladimir Putin has recast himself as a wartime president. Uh, wartime presidents um, uh, don't quit. Uh, and they need wars, and they need victories. Um, and therefore, uh, it seems to me that the West's response to the current situation, including, by the way, and, and perhaps especially at this point, the December 9th negotiations in, in Paris, uh, is extremely important. And that is, for all these reasons, Russia, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ukraine matters to us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I probably, I had a different plan, but I probably will go to uh, Elon now, because you already started talking about uh, uh, Moscow strategy and uh, and their and their views. So, um, in reality, Kremlin uh, never fully accepted Ukraine's independence. And as a historian uh, Serhiy Pohi put it, Moscow viewed Ukraine not as uh, as a key element, as, uh, viewed Ukraine as a key element of uh, former Soviet Empire and also hist historically. Uh, Ethnic, uh, ethnically, the heart of modern Russia. So, um, uh, Ilan, uh, how would you uh, expand on that issue? And um, what is objective? What is Russian objective in the region and in the world as well? Right. right. Uh, thank you, uh, Miroslav. Um, so, no, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I think it's correct to talk about the uh, historical tendency to. Uh, view uh, Ukraine as uh, a vassal, as less than independent. Um, I do think it has uh, particular salience uh, today in terms of what the Kremlin thinks about what it sees when it looks abroad, uh, effectively in, in, in four respects. The first is that today's Russia, uh, the Russia under Vladimir Putin, 
is not a status quo power. It's a revisionist power. And it's a power that seeks to improve its strategic position and to do so at the expense of other states, most directly neighboring states. Um, this is true in the context of Ukraine, for sure, but it's not just in the context of Ukraine. If you look at what Russia's doing uh, internationally in the Middle East, how it's uh, manipulated the opening in Syria that was created by the start of the Syrian civil war uh, to expand and improve its position there. Look at the arc of Russian strategy in Africa. I think it's very clear that uh, Russia is pushing on open doors and it's, fine. it's looking for open doors where it can improve its position. Uh, the second is that in this context, uh, Ukraine is very much what we would call the canary in the coal mine. Um, there is a Russian uh, parable which roughly translated, uh, uh, translates into the appetite comes with the eating. And there is a sense that Ukraine is not an isolated event. Ukraine uh, is a follow-on event based upon the lack of Western response uh, to previous aggression uh, in places like Georgia. And so uh, this is a weakness in the context of defense, uh, but it also opens up so this large question of Western resolve, and Western resolve in, in, in a military sense and also in a political sense. Um, I, last month, before he stepped down as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Dunford uh, gave a very lengthy interview to Newsweek in which he talked about the fact that he was worried that NATO's strategic uh, edge, NATO's comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis Russia was actually eroding. And it was eroding as a result not only of technological improvements in Russian military capabilities, but also in, in light of this, this increasingly aggressive international posture that Russia was uh, assuming. Um, and yet what you see is a Atlantic alliance, at least, that seems divided about how to respond. And I would only point to the fact that the French president, in the run-up to yesterday's summit, spent a lot of time talking about de-escalation in the context of sanctions, when in fact uh, Russia has not done pretty much anything of substance to warrant such a de-escalation, such a reduction of European sanctions. But, you know, this is, I think this is one side of the equation. The other side is, and the last point is, this sense of siege that permeates in Moscow because it's a real thing. Uh, and uh, the strategy that you see Russia employing is that the best defense is a good offense, mm -hmm. because Russia senses that there is an encroachment of uh, alternate political organization, right? Uh, color revolutions, uh, political pluralism uh, that it needs to push back against, and it's doing so. Um, and in this context as well, Ukraine is a very important test case, because Ukraine's choice to pursue alignment with the West and to eschew partnership in uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, partnership in sort of the, the uh, Eurasianist construct that Vladimir Putin articulated uh, is very important. And it's, it needs to be supported because as goes Ukraine, so goes the rest of the post-Soviet space. Thank you very much. I know that uh, I heard that Senator uh, Murphy is here, so we will stop the panel We'll let uh, senators speak and we'll uh, resume uh, later. Oh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here today. Thank you to Ambassador Herbst and to the Atlanta Council and others for uh, convening uh, this gathering. Uh, I am uh, really heartened to see uh, a full capacity room invested in making sure that we maintain here in the United States Congress a bipartisan consensus surrounding the need for the United States to continue to support Ukraine. Uh, especially in its continued hour of need. And I'm uh, also glad that uh, this panel will be uh, bracketed by remarks uh, by myself and Senator uh, Johnson. Uh, Senator Johnson and I just got the opportunity to speak for a while yesterday about uh, our continued interest in making sure that despite the continuing headlines um, in this town uh, that we maintain that bipartisan consensus uh, as well. Uh, and it is really incumbent upon uh, so much of the foreign policy community in Washington that is invested in the U.S.-Ukraine bilateral relationship um, to keep us on task, uh, to keep us on task and to make sure uh, that we get beyond uh, this moment. Uh, because if Ukraine ultimately fails because uh, the United States positioning um, changes, uh, it will come at a great cost to our country's national security. 
Um, and so um, let me thank you, first and foremost, for putting uh, this uh, together. Um, what Russia fears most is a successful Ukraine. Uh, and well, we don't have a NATO treaty obligation with uh, Ukraine, what we know is that Russia isn't the only country in the world that is interested in starting to fudge international borders, trying to assert themselves beyond their internationally recognized space. And from the beginning, the reason that we have cared so deeply about pushing back on uh, the Russian invasion in Crimea and Luhansk and Donetsk is because we know that if Russia gets away with it there, not only will they be more likely to try to press out into the periphery um, in other places uh, and ways, but other nations uh, who have similar designs will do the same. There has to be a consequence. Uh, when you breach internationally recognized borders. And uh, the United States is still the only country in the world that can convene a global conversation around how to deliver those consequences. Uh, and so it is appropriate uh, that though Ukraine may not be part of NATO, that we still have a vested interest in their independence and their sovereignty. Now, we can't ignore the moment that we are living in today. Uh, it still is um, infuriating to me that this administration uh, is taking steps on a daily basis to weaken the Zelensky administration, whether it be their myopic focus on Ukrainian corruption as a means to justify the actions of this summer and this fall, or this new insistence that it was Ukraine and the president of Ukraine himself interfering in the 2016 elections, not Russia. Uh, none of that is helpful in trying to, to, to maintain and rebuild this bipartisan consensus uh, around support for Ukraine. Uh, and so um, I hope that uh, the handful of members of Congress who are trying to uh, push these conspiracy theories about what Ukraine has done in the past will remain outliers. And I was heartened, frankly, in the last couple of days to see um, the majority of my Republican colleagues in the Senate uh, make public what we all know. No, uh, it was Russia that uh, manipulated the 2016 elections, not the government of Ukraine. Um, but uh, let's use our time today, and I know you will, um, to try to uh, set up some tasks for Congress as we move out of this impeachment process uh, and into next spring uh, and to next summer. Um, I admittedly was a slow convert to uh, supplying the Ukrainian military with uh, lethal uh, American aid. Um, I have never believed uh, that there is a military solution to the incursion of Russia into Ukraine. I don't think that Putin actually wants to march his army or any proxy force on Kyiv. I think his desire and his design is to economically and politically break the country so that eventually Ukraine makes a decision to uh, just give in and give up and, and elect leadership that will uh, seek a detente with Russia that puts the Kremlin back in charge of um, affairs in Ukraine as they were during the majority of the pre-Poroshenko era. Um, and, and so I make the case that while continuing military aid to Ukraine is really important, um, because I do think you need to send this message to Russia that there is going to be a continued cost to trying to move the line of contact. Um, ultimately, the most important support that we can give Ukraine is non-military support, is the support necessary to make sure that they are guarded uh, politically and economically from all of the ways that Russia continues to try to undermine them. And that, I think, needs to be our primary project as we think about ways for Congress to continue to support this, this new um, and, I think, very promising government uh, in Kyiv. And so that means um, making sure that we are helping them with their efforts to rebuff the cyber incursions and the propaganda efforts that Russia continues to spin up um, inside Ukraine. Remember, Russia is using Ukraine to midwife a, a lot of propaganda and, and, uh, and cyber attack 
uh, methods that they could then export to the United States. And so we have an interest in confronting those tools in Kyiv and throughout Ukraine because of our interest in supporting an independent Ukraine, but also because we want to protect ourselves. And the Global Engagement Center that Senator Portman and I uh, established and funded is an uh, important first step to increasing the American commitment to fighting back against those efforts from uh, Russia. Second, um, we need to help President Zelensky in what is a very sincere effort to tackle what is a legitimate corruption problem in that country. I wish the administration would talk about something else other than the lingering corruption issues in Ukraine. There's lots of good news stories, and there are frankly other challenges that we need to face there. Um, but by year's end, there will be 500 prosecutors um, that weren't doing the job in tackling corruption in Ukraine who will be out the door, uh, replaced by people who have as a mission, not the protection of their political universe, but the rule of law. And we should be supporting President Zelensky in that effort. Um, we made a big difference when we put a little bit of money on the table a few years ago to reform the Ukrainian uh, police force. Um, that's resulted in a uh, much cleaner administration of the law inside the capital city. We could be, we could be supporting, um, rather than just watching President Zelensky's anti-corruption efforts. Um, and third, um, I don't know what the final outcome will be on Nord Stream 2, um, but I am doubtful uh, of our ability to stop it in its tracks, given how far it has gone, and given the fact that Vladimir Putin is willing to pay whatever cost is necessary to underwrite a project that, frankly, was not economically or financially viable from the start. And so we need to have um, some other answers for what is going to be a continued effort for Russia to try to um, ply uh, in, in, uh, other nations uh, into its orbit through its energy bounty. And so uh, I am hopeful that in the next week we are going to um, pass a bill in the Foreign Relations Committee that has already passed through the House of Representatives to set up a new $1 billion energy independence financing mechanism in the federal government to be used in places like Eastern Europe um, so that they don't have to be reliant on gas pipelines coming in from Russia, that they can actually um, engage in energy independence projects with U.S. financing help. That's a bill that uh, I wrote with Senator Johnson, uh, and it has passed the House and hopefully passing the Senate uh, very, very soon. Um, and so I just hope that we, um, we focus on the ways in which we can make Russia pay a cost for their incursion into Ukraine, but understand uh, the panoply of methods by which we do that. It is not just about whether we sell Javelin missiles or not uh, to Ukraine. It's about delivering them the support uh, to make sure that they can fight back against all of the ways that Russia is trying to undermine them. Um, I've never been more optimistic than I am today about the future of a country that I have come to love. Uh, I've traveled there, as many of you know, uh, about a half dozen times uh, since I was first elected to Congress, got the chance to stand on the uh, protest stage at the Maidan with Senator McCain in the winter of 2013, and I am um, a believer in President Zelensky. Um, it is never easy to upset the status quo in a country where uh, the plutocracy and the oligarchy is so firmly entrenched. Um, but I think this is our best shot. Uh, and I'm so saddened that this administration um, ha hasn't chosen to invest in a, with a laser-like focus in this new president to help him, uh, and instead has ordered affairs in a way that uh, makes it much more difficult for him to succeed. This place, um, Congress can try uh, to change that reality. We can figure out a way uh, to come together uh, and support this new government, uh, support a, a comprehensive set of tools that the administration can use to try to undermine uh, Russia's incursion into that country and other nations. And if we do that, um, I think that uh, our policy towards Ukraine and the region and Ukraine itself will come out stronger on the other end. And I'm just so glad to be able to be here. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Senator Murphy, reminding us about uh, Ukrainian status, ta status in NATO and uh, why United States would never use military force in Ukraine. I think we need to talk about it. And it's a good reminder as well uh, that uh, Ukraine was born nuclear. Um, nearly 2,000 nuclear uh, warheads and 2,500 tactical nuclear weapons made Ukraine the world 
uh, third largest nuclear power. United States Secretary of uh, United uh, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker uh, tutored President Bush about the importance of disarming Ukraine. Strategically, there is no one, no other foreign issue more deserving your attention or time, Baker said. Ambassador Herbst knows in details how Ukraine was pressured to give up nuclear weapons. Looking back, do you think this was the right move to make Ukraine send all its nuclear arsenal to Russia? And could the United States have done more and given Ukraine not just assurance, but guarantees of its uh, territorial integrity? Uh, I think that at the time, uh, the policy of denuclearizing not just Ukraine, but also Oh, yes. oh, there it is. The policy of denuclearizing not just Ukraine, but Belarus and Kazakhstan did make good sense. And uh, of course, there were difficult negotiations uh, regarding the terms for that denuclearization. And there's a great controversy in Ukraine and criticism of the Western and the United States position uh, because the United States provided something called assurances as opposed to guarantees uh, of Ukraine's territorial integrity in, in response to the denuclearization. And it is true that assurances did not require the United States to absolutely make certain that there'd be no territorial changes. Uh, and that's a lawyer's response to justify a position. But it's also true that in terms of uh, America's reputation, Assurances and guarantees are two things that sound very similar. And it was a hit to the American reputation that Moscow was able to seize Crimea without a strong response from the West, including the United States. Uh, it's worth noting that the absence of a strong response also came from China, which signed um, letters reaffirming Budapest, as well as France and the United Kingdom. Uh, bottom line, this is the situation we have. There is strong support for the United States now for Ukraine. This support, as outlined by um, our earlier speakers, is a vital interest to the United States because Moscow is a revisionist power today. Their appetite goes beyond the Donbass, and their appetite extends, including further into Europe. We do not have a commitment to defend Ukraine with our blood, but we do have such a commitment in the Baltic states. Stopping Putin in Donbass makes it certain that we will not have to stop him in Estonia. And we can do that because Ukraine is fighting for its, for its sovereignty and its territorial integrity. We can do that by providing more military support, by providing more economic assistance, and more diplomatic support. This is the smart policy. This is the prudent policy. And I don't have any doubt that if we pursue this policy, Putin's revisionist agenda will be defeated in Donbass, and we don't have to worry about him elsewhere. And that is our vital interest. Thank you, John. And uh, again, uh, there's one more um, uh, that reassurance package was involved uh, involved NATO. So in 1990, in 1994, um, NATO created so-called uh, Partnership uh, for Peace program and uh, uh, developed uh, open door policy uh, for potential new members um, uh, in Europe. I would like to address uh, address uh, next question to Heather. Um, how substantive the, the, the and real was this program, and why have NATO and the West uh, failed to be more effective in the face of Russian's strong stand first against NATO uh, expansion to Ukraine and elsewhere, and now Russian aggression? Well, Miroslav, I'll just push this over here. Miroslav, thank you so much, and to John and the Atlantic Council, thank you. The best antidote to Russian aggression is bipartisanship here in the United States, and I'm so grateful to the members of Congress that continue to reinforce that. 
We have unity. There are 10 think tanks from the left, center, and right that are uh, absolutely reinforcing of one, one another of our assessments and what needs to be done. Uh, so bipartisanship and unity uh, are very powerful, and I, I thank you so much. Miroslav, I'm actually going to take a, a, a step back in history, not to 1994, actually to 1990. And it is an absolute wonderful uh, happenstance that as today we watch uh, NATO leaders uh, complete their meeting in London uh, for the 70th anniversary of NATO, actually in 1990 NATO met. Uh, in London and offered a political declaration. And I, I want to say this is this is where this idea begins. And, and it's not necessarily the George H.W. speech on the chicken Kiev, which is as important uh, that, as that was. I turn to President Bush's Mainz speech in May of 1989 when he set forward a vision, an American vision of a Europe whole and free. But let me go back to this 1990 political declaration because NATO leaders at that time welcomed the Warsaw Treaty Organization uh, to form a joint declaration to solemnly state that they were no longer adversaries and reaffirm our intention to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state, and of course reinforcing the United Nations and the OSCE, of course the CSCE at that time. And NATO invited Gorbachev to speak to NATO. He invited these countries to come and establish diplomatic liaison missions to NATO. That's why we have a Russian mission to NATO. That was our vision. And, and President uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush's speech at Mainz, he said, democracy's journey east will not be easy. And that was exactly the message. And so what you had after that invitation in 1990, you had building blocks, which were the Partnership for Peace, which opened the opportunity for those who wish uh, to take the obligations and the responsibilities, which are great, to become a member of NATO, but who were willing to take that on, that door would remain open. And there were ways to do that. So there was a window that was opened in 1994. And that door tragically closed in 2008. Although rhetorically that door is open and NATO is going to welcome its 30th member, North Macedonia, in early next year, <coughs> it remained closed to go farther east. And I think that is, for, for me, the challenge of making sure that we reaffirm our commitment because, as, as all the speakers have said, NATO's security and therefore America's security begins in Ukraine. And I think that is what we have to reaffirm for the American people. This is why we have 4,500 US forces based in Poland today. They are fighting for freedom. We just stop talking like that. So this is a powerful moment. I know, as, as Senator Murphy said, we hope we get past this moment. And this is an incredibly difficult moment for our nation. Perhaps the one silver lining, and I'll end with this, is that Ukraine had dropped from the agenda. We haven't heard about it in newspapers. This opportunity has reinforced our understanding of why Ukraine is important. It reminds people that nearly 14,000 Ukrainians have died, 1.5 million are displaced, that US forces are protecting NATO. This is what's important. Leave out the noise, focus on what's important. And this conversation is helping that. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I think it's uh, again you you mentioned uh, when the the date or time when the those um, the door was closed, and uh, I would like to actually uh, turn to um, Donald Jensen because uh, one of the uh, uh, big um, uh, issue that uh, Moscow took as a threat to them was was the uh, were the uh, colored revolutions in uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, and um, and uh, Kyrgyzstan. So my question is: um, Did the uh, United States uh, fully recognize how threatening? Uh, this way for Kremlin and Putin uh, personal power. And that's maybe why he decided to go with invasion of Georgia and, and uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Miroslava. Uh, thank you to John and Melinda and the Atlantic Council team for putting this uh, fine event together and all of you for being here. Uh, let me make several points to answer your question, Miroslava. 
Uh, I think the colored revolutions that you described were a series of important but largely overlooked U.S. foreign policy triumphs. Uh, the, and as you recall, in 2004, 5, and 6, the U.S. was preoccupied with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and terrorism. And I think we barely received any attention uh, in Washington looking back. Uh, but that's quite, diff quite a different story in Moscow in many ways, and it's often been compared to 9-11. These were fundamental changes in, uh, that shocked Moscow, that surprised Moscow, and that were key drivers uh, in its subsequent much harder line toward the West and to its neighbors. Why? First of all, the Russian elite saw uh, these revolutions as leading to a potential security threat to Russia, which wants to control uh, its uh, neighbors, which wants to extend its influence abroad. And they saw these very much as, as well as NATO expansion as direct security threats. Number two, they saw it as a threat to the Kremlin uh, hold on its people uh, uh, as well. If it could happen in Kiev or in Tbilisi, it could happen in Moscow. And this, I think, spurred, as I said, a long, long reaction, evolution, uh, or regression in the regime's view of the world and the regime's behavior, the Munich speech, the war in Georgia, ultimately culminating in, of course, the events in the Maidan, which became, looking back, increasingly not just soft power, but increasingly militarized. So today we have a much more, a much tougher uh, view of Kremlin, starting going back to the colored revolutions for all the fits and starts and disappointments they had at the time. But I want, I want to ask ourselves and ask you, what are the lessons we have learned from that sub, the subsequent history since uh, those days 15 years ago? Number one, I think it tells us that Russia's strategic culture, the way it looks at the world and how it behaves accordingly, is quite a bit different from that in Brussels or London or the United States maybe even in Paris. Uh, Russia sees problems, issues very differently. And so when you see, as you often do here in town, about the calls to engage Russia, well, that's simply, simply not enough. We have to engage Russia cautiously, realizing how they see problems quite differently and acting accordingly. Number two, and it's a more hopeful lesson, I think, is that I think that Putin repeatedly underestimates and misreads the power of grassroots political and social movements, not just in the Maidan, but elsewhere as well. An advisor to Putin once told me he thinks that there's nobody he can't buy or manipulate. Well, the people of Ukraine showed that he was wrong. And I think that this, this is a short-sightedness. There's this keen vulnerability in the Kremlin. And the third lesson I would say is that uh, it's, it, all of this colored revolution and the Kremlin's reaction to it shows to what a key extent uh, Kremlin domestic politics and regime preservation drives Russian behavior. It's not just about the, the realist paradigm of national interests and spheres of influence. It's about a much more fundamental thing, which is, will these people rule forever or will they not? So let me conclude by saying this is not uh, this, this is not just a call to realism, it's a call to all of us for idealism because there's much more we can do to respond to the threat and the challenge, and that's why I'm so grateful to see so many people here today. John has a comment. Uh, I'd like to follow up on one point. Um, we've seen emerge over the past several years, but especially recently, um, a group that calls itself realists Mm -hmm. But I think they should be really described not as realists, but as, as ostrich realists who somehow think that Kremlin aggression was a result of American policies. And the case that is made by the ostrich realists that it was in fact the expansion of NATO that's produced the crisis in Ukraine. What they don't understand is that the Kremlin's policies in Ukraine, which is currently a policy of war in Donbass after the seizure of Crimea, is the natural result of the frozen conflict policies that they put into effect the day the Soviet Union died. Literally, years before people began to talk about NATO enlargement, the policies of frozen conflicts evident in Georgia, in Moldova, and also in Nagorno-Karabakh went into place right away. 
The people running those policies were in the power ministries in Moscow. We don't know if these were their policies without Yeltsin's approval or with Yeltsin's approval, who was then president. But these were the policies. And the natural extension of that was the Kremlin War in Georgia in 2008, and of course, the war on Ukraine since 2014. Yeah, actually, um, I just uh, one more ma emphasize this. Russia manufactured conflict, first Transnistria uh, in Moldova, then occupation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia, the second invasion of Georgia in 2008, and finally the invasion of Ukraine and uh, occupation of uh, Crimea, those manufactured conflicts. So Ukraine is, uh, has, uh, has been fighting now the war with Russia for more than five years and with almost 14,000 um, people uh, killed. Um, the new Ukrainian president, though, seems to uh, think that he can make a peace with Putin. Uh, December 9 um, can become a decisive moment. Um, United States, uh, unfortunately, is not uh, present at the, that discussion. It's only observer for the, uh, for the Normandy format um, negotiation. Um, I would like to ask you a double question. Uh, what are the pitfalls for Ukraine in these negotiations? Uh, what would be the best outcome? And uh, how do you see United States uh, respond the position in uh, in this negotiations. Thank you. Whoever yes, well, can, I, can I start? Thanks. Um, this is a this is a very important question. Um, and frankly, um, given the position, or at least the way I read the position of Chancellor Merkel and especially uh, uh, President um, uh, Macron, there is um, uh, there's not much hope. Um, the so so let me let me start. Uh, Many in this room um, may have read a, a, a very interesting, for the for the want of a better term, um, interview that uh, President Macron gave to mm -hmm. um, the Economist. Um, it's it's gained it gained uh, currency largely because he called NATO brain dead. Um, but there are some other interesting things um, that he said. Um, he said, and 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 of course he is the host. Of, of, of the December 9. And the hosts, as we know, are not merely providing physical space for such negotiations. They, they, they really play an oversized role in the framework. So, so one of the things he said was that um, uh, he, he, he said we need to rethink Europe's strategic relations with Russia. Uh, he believes that exactly as John uh, said that it was the fear of NATO's and EU's expansion into Russia, what he called safe zone, um, especially Ukraine, that led to Moscow's decision to put a stop to it. So uh, Macron asks, what guarantees does Putin need? And he answers, sort of like in Odessa, uh, with another question, um, which is no further advances in his safety zone. He poses it as a question, but to him it's a rhetorical question. So what the implication is, so long as everybody agrees not to intrude into Russia's security zone, um, and so long as we remove this, this unnecessary irritant um, of Donbass, Russia will become a responsible um, uh, European citizen. And uh, you know, I touched on that already. Um, um, I, I don't want to repeat why Putin recast himself as a wartime president, but there are very, uh, very good economic reasons for that, and the reasons of domestic legitimacy. But um, in terms of the details, um, it has been said. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Zelensky said it during his campaign, but also, of course, in the long, also rather interesting interview he gave the other day to uh, uh, Time magazine. Um, he said absolutely no um, election in Ukraine. You know, the Stalmeyer formula is that there's election, it's certified by OECD, and then that state, that Luhansk and Donetsk get the um, autonomy status, uh, which, of course, in effect means a, a Russian-controlled enclave inside Ukraine. Well, Zelensky said uh, no such, no such um, uh, election will take place until three things happen. Um, the establishment of Ukrainian control over the border, 
uh, the disarmament of what the Russia, well, Putin recently called Apolchensi, which is, you know, the, the volunteer commander rebels, um, totally supported by Russia and maintained by Russia. Um, and the third thing, the withdrawal of all so-called foreign troops. Well, we know what foreign troops there are. Um, and it is here, I think, where the crux of the problem is, because I think that on December 9th, Ukraine will be pressured to skip over those three things mm -hmm. and just, you know, let's postpone them. Let's do it later. But now let's hold the elections and therefore I'll legitimize essentially by proxy, but, but de facto Russia control over the territory. And I think this is um, 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 what, what I think ought to bother us the most at the moment. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, I, I think in some ways, um, there, uh, when the Normandy format was created, it was a spontaneous format on the anniversary of the uh, Normandy invasion. And it was that moment when the US, and I would argue the UK, because of their own responsibilities for the Budapest Memorandum, needed to engage in that and be part of that conversation. And decisions were made to manage it unilaterally, a US-Russian dialogue, uh, which was withheld with Mr. Surkov. But um, we missed that opportunity to strengthen French and German resolve. I, I don't disagree with Leon about President Macron's view, his speech in August to the French uh, chief of missions began to set the stage for a new approach. Of course, that was not a European position. That was a unilateral French position. Um, but I would uh, offer a thought. If you are following the news that's coming out of Berlin today, uh, the, uh, it looks as if the German intelligence uh, has determined that there was a Russian government assassination on the streets of Berlin. And they have now expelled two Russian diplomats. Um, this has actually been hardening German views. So we could, uh, I think, see some uh, German firmness uh, here. This is not an agreed position. But you're absolutely right. What has always been the problem with the Minsk agreement, it's been the sequencing. And the sequencing is where the contradiction is, where the Russians' interpretation is that the Ukrainians will change the constitution, decentralize, hold the elections, and then the Russians will not do anything. And I think this is where we need to compare the uh, so-called ceasefire in Georgia, which has never been implemented, which, which the lines have continued to push out. They will never implement that. So if President Zelensky has to give on his three conditions, and I thought that interview was extremely important and powerful. If he, if he has to relinquish those, I think he has an internal problem that he does not uh, need at the moment. And I just cannot see the security situation in Donbass allowing elections to be held. There are ceasefire violations every single day. The uh, OSC monitoring mission is under fire every single day, even if we suspended the situation and said, OK, hold elections. They could not physically hold them because the security situation uh, cannot happen. But I do applaud just one final note, pass it to John. I think President Zelensky has been correct in, in addressing the need to help the people that are trapped in Donbass for getting ease for pensions. We need to help people who are suffering. And his message of unity is powerful. That's powerful. We need to support in that effort. But uh, if he gives on those conditions and follows the Steinmeier formula, I believe we will have our third frozen conflict in the region. Um, I think we should understand that uh, the United States or the, we the Western Hemisphere, excuse me, the, the North American continent is not the only habitat for ostrich realists. They can also be found in Europe. And I'm saying that now because uh, President Macron, if he pursues the policies that he seems to be suggesting, will be following in the footsteps of President Sarkozy, who led the diplomatic effort after the Kremlin War on Georgia. And the terms that were set for Moscow's withdrawal from Georgia, uh, which Heather referred to, have not been implemented. And so one bad French-led negotiation should not be followed by a second. Thank you, Mayor Slava. I, I, this discussion reminds me of what my friend and colleague Ben Hodges says, that the Russian peacekeepers, they want a peace and then they'll keep it. Uh, 
My concern, in addition to what John and Leon have said, is that I think some people on Team Zelensky and sometimes the president himself say things that either seem uncoordinated or naive or unrealistic. And I think uh, this is an invitation to the Kremlin to try and test them on what they perceive or assess as weaknesses in the Ukrainian position. And that's why I think the Normandy process is fraught with danger, not because I don't support President Zelensky, but because sometimes they say things which I don't fully uh, understand where they're coming from. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, although I think in the end, well, they'll be okay. But again, there's room for concern, given the factors that, that uh, Heather and, and Leon and John said, for that they're gonna be under pressure to do things that are not fully thought through, not fully coordinated, or not really hard-headed enough to deal with the threat that remains, if more sophisticated in a way from the East, but is certainly as strong as it has been in the last five years. I, I, I always have. I always have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would, I would just content myself. I, I, I fully subscribe to what Leon has talked about. Um, I, I would only make two sort of final points, macro points, uh, in particular on the, on the U.S. policy question. Um, I think it bears noting that the current status quo is a status quo that favors Russia. Russia wants to stay, but it doesn't want to pay. And it has created a situation that has de facto eroded Ukrainian sovereignty by depressing U Ukraine's economic vibrancy, right? And so the optimal solution, right? And we, uh, it's not up to us to dictate the particulars of what Ukraine should or shouldn't do. But I think the optimal solution in the broad brush is one that imposes costs upon Russia for this adventure and one that strengthens Ukraine's economic integrity, uh, and as a result, its, uh, its uh, sovereignty and its political integrity, right? And that's the broad brush of what the US policy should be. The particulars, I think, can be negotiated out by people who are far above my pay grade. But in general, I think it, it bears noting that going into these negotiations, it's very clear that delay, uh, drawn out, protracted talks benefit only one place. They don't benefit Washington, they don't benefit Kiev, they benefit Moscow. Um, I would like to um, move ahead with a NATO question. Uh, since we just celebrated 70th anniversary of NATO, uh, US is um, planning to cut its spending uh, on NATO, and there is there are talk uh, of uh, increasing support for Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, how do you see this dynamic uh, play out? Yeah. Happy to. I, I think there's a, a little bit of misunderstanding. The announcement of the U.S. reducing its contribution to the NATO Common Fund, which is a common pot, uh, and the uh, German government, others increasing that, that actually does not necessarily impact anything about NATO's contribution. Um, in its support of its efforts in Ukraine. In fact, if anything, it, it, the U.S. loses a bit of rebate that it gets out of the common funds, but it was a demonstration to reduce the U.S. bill uh, and to uh, increase uh, Europe's bill. I see support for Ukraine increasing uh, bipartisanship, whether that's through the European Deterrence Initiative. Of course, that fund did get hit because of uh, the White House's decision <coughs> to redirect funds to construction of, of the border wall. But I think there's increased, as I'm seeing in the conversations around the Defense National Authorization Act, of increasing those funds. Again, this is, again, very much what this, what this conversation has been. People are redoubling their efforts because they understand this, uh, its importance. Uh, I think you'll speak in uh, Don's reference to, to General Hodges. I think when you speak to U.S. Uh, military leaders, um, they are incredibly impressed uh, with the Ukraine's military. And again, Ukraine is a laboratory for Russian tactics and tools. We wish it were not so. We are learning an enormous amount of how that works, and that's incredibly beneficial to the United States and to NATO. So I actually, again, see this as this is going to redouble our efforts to support Ukraine. But across the way, there is military and security assistance, absolutely. There has to be strong support economically. There has to be strong uh, support 
politically, we cannot do this for Ukraine. Ukraine must do this for itself. And if, uh, you know, now, if, if not the moment, I don't know when it will be. Uh, so this is a, an incredibly important moment. But I see, I see strong uh, support for NATO. The concern that I have is the Hungarian government and its continued blocking of a formalized NATO-Ukraine uh, discussion, uh, commission discussion, and that is something that must be resolved as quickly as possible. Anyone would like to comment on NATO? Um, I still, um, I would then another question on NATO. Um, uh, yesterday, Ukrainian parliament, three uh, parties actually joined together with their statement and their uh, strong, uh, strong desire to become a NATO member. How do you see this uh, issue play out? And is NATO even ready to discuss uh, this issue in this particular moment of time? Just, I mean, it's it's a symbolic um, it's a symbolic measure. Um, it, one of the um, purposes of of seizing and and effectively holding Donbas is a sort of a permanent Trojan horse inside of Ukraine. Um, Any time there is a movement towards even the EU. Um, that conflict um, either could be restarted um, or it could be, you know, remember that as a result of the election, um, those areas um, will essentially control, uh, send um, um, eventually uh, deputies to the Rada, the uh, Ukrainian parliament, that are wholly beholden to Moscow. And so they will, of course, spearhead any opposition to, to uh, Ukraine's orientation to the West. Um, there was a, there's a, there's a, um, uh, one of the leading uh, Russian experts whom I respect very much by the name of Valery Solovey, and he said um, that Donetsk and Lugansk are uh, built in circuit breakers. Um, and and any time there is a danger of, I mean, this is a symbolic statement, but say it, it proceeds. Um, to some sort of legislative, some concrete legislative measure. Uh, that circuit breaker could be flipped for Moscow and, and that effort would be derailed. NATO expansion? So <laughs> I, I, I would just say in the interim, because there's not going to be right now the political space to allow this, I would argue NATO just needs to be more present in Ukraine. Very mm -hmm. similar to in Georgia, NATO now has a center in Georgia. There just has to be more physical presence, more engagement, more interaction. And as I said, the more Ukraine reforms, the more it returns its strength. We need to, NATO just needs to be with it step by step, shoulder to shoulder, as does the EU, as does the US. Marisol, can I just hop in? And at yes, the risk, yes, yes. Uh, by the way, at the risk of being the skunk at the garden party, I don't think we do uh, ourselves any favors when we paper over the very significant problems that the alliance currently has. Right? This is uh, what we're seeing uh, yesterday. What we're seeing today <clears throat> is not a show of great unity among mm -hmm. the alliance nations. Right? So the question about bringing in additional partners potentially, the que you know. The, the truism is that alliances creep along at the pace of their most grudging member, right? This is a, uh, a, a conversation, this is a conference about Ukraine, it's not a conference about Turkey, but it's relevant here, because at a moment where we have serious doubts about the integrity of the alliance as a whole, I think, you know, what Heather talked about, about, you know, being present, being there, being fully capitalized, being fully capable in a military sense of defending the current parameters of the alliance becomes supremely important, and it's the prerequisite for having any further conversation. Strengthening in Ukraine, that's the main. Uh, John. Um, uh, there's one more point following up on what, what Heather said. Uh, we have not discussed today the front that the Kremlin opened in its war on Ukraine in the spring of 2018, which was the strangulation of trade from Donbass in the Sea of Azov. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that NATO has done partly in response is to increase naval patrols in the Black Sea, particularly in the Eastern Black Sea. But in fact, under the understandings of the uh, Straits of Montreux Convention, which regulates traffic, military traffic, among other things, into the Black Sea, there can be more NATO patrols. So this is something that I believe the United States should be advocating and that NATO should be doing, sending more ships 
into the Black Sea is remind the Kremlin that the naval component of its action against Ukraine is producing a response which is not, not helpful to Kremlin security. Yeah, John preempted me. Yes, I would emphasize in terms of making the case for Ukraine's eventual membership in NATO, we have to see the Black Sea region as an emerging security area that needs much more attention. We've spoken a lot about Slovakia Gap or the Baltic, Baltic states, but the, Bal the, the, the Syria, Turkey, Sea of Azov region needs much more attention. It's very threatening, very ominous, and is a cardinal keystone to Russia's move to the southwest in that region. I think Ukraine can play a lot more than it does in addressing some of those threats. Well, I was just going to say, and this is where to bring Elon and John together, this is where the Turkish-Russian relationship has to be watched very, very closely. Um, and certainly Turkey has been a very focused uh, and right now proper uh, actor in following and implementing the Montreux Convention, but there is, as again, this is history repeating itself, there is enormous pressure, pressure being placed from Moscow uh, to prevent exactly those NATO forces in, uh, maritime forces into the Black Sea. And I think, again, strategically, we need to see the, uh, the theater of operation is the Black Sea, Turkish Straits, and the Eastern Mediterranean. These are now one uh, continuous uh, area of operations, and we need to think in those broader strategic uh, terms. Um, up until now, um this current crisis in, in American politics, Ukraine enjoyed strong bipartisan uh, support in Congress. Um, does uh, not, I don't want to talk about impeachment, that, but does uh, being in the middle of US partisan battle uh, may make Ukraine toxic? And is it possible for Ukraine to avoid uh, falling uh, victim to partisan politics in the United States? <laughs> Let me grab that bull by the horns. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I am. Um, so I would actually point out, uh, at least from where I'm sitting, that I mean, obviously it's a huge problem. And, and you know, uh, this is a conversation that, uh, at least in Washington, is all consuming. And it's very hard to talk about legitimate strategic interest. I mean, after all, that's the purpose of this conference, to talk about legitimate strategic interest in Ukraine and why the long game prevails here. I would actually point out something else, which is to sort of throw the ball over uh, in the court of the Ukrainians themselves. Because the more pervasive and potentially dangerous trend that I see is Ukraine fatigue on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. uh, where there are a lot of demands for greater transparency, greater anti-corruption efforts. And there's been a lot that's been done economically, in the health sector, in the uh, sort of in the transparency of the security services. But there is a sense that it's not moving fast enough. It's not moving as broadly enough as at least certain members of Congress expected. And the longer that situation and that appearance prevails, the harder it is to drum up bipartisan support to continue to support Ukraine despite all the political craziness that's going on. I, my sense is that that's a real problem, and it's a problem that I think, at least in my interactions, Ukrainian officials don't adequately understand what the temperature is on Capitol Hill, um, and it's a conversation that needs to be had. I think that there is a danger that the intense partisan fight um, could lead to problems in our support for Ukraine. But I think it's an unlikely outcome. I think that there is, there remains strong bipartisan support in Congress, and for that matter, strong support for Ukraine in the executive branch, despite all, all the things we've seen over the past few months. And I would agree with Elon that Ukraine forcefully going after corruption and working on reform will improve their standing in Washington. But I think that even with the ambiguities on that front of the past couple of years, support for Ukraine has remained strong and Ukraine fatigue, quote unquote, has been kept in check. And again, you know, we, we had excellent turnout for this event today. We have bipartisan support for this event, reflecting the understanding that this is a critical American interest to stop Putin's revisionism in the east of Ukraine. So I would just uh, just uh, briefly say that I, there is no substitute for Ukraine doing the work. 
there is no substitute. It, uh, and, and that is where uh, all of this comes down to. It, for, for Ukraine to be successful, it has to do the work. Um, I would also just, uh, just note um, that uh, President Zelensky's interview, uh, I thought that was extremely powerful. He himself is a very powerful voice, and sometimes there are many voices saying they speak on behalf of, and it gets very confusing. I would argue right now there needs to be fewer voices, uh, but voices of clarity, uh, not shifting around, particularly as it gets closer to the questions that are being raised here in Washington, clear, consistent messages from President Zelensky himself are critical and doing the work. And then the fatigue is not there. The, this, the support and the hope are present because we can see that work. Nope. Okay. Uh, so um, we will be um, summarizing. So I would like uh, each of the panelists uh, to um, actually go back to the to the question of our panel. Why does Ukraine matter, and what is United States strategic interest uh, in uh, Ukraine? <laughs> well. Uh, just very briefly, um, uh, again, uh, the, the Vladimir Putin is a, a wartime president. Um, he's a president for life, and for um, because um, of of his own, um, I, I believe, very deeply held uh, ideas and the domestic political imperatives, um, he needs. Um, uh, Essentially, Russia um, and 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 Russian people, believing that sort of two contradictory things at once that that Russia is is under siege, it's a it's a it's a besieged fortress, and at the same time, um, it's victorious in in its dealing with the West. Mm -hmm. um, the the rhetoric in in the Duma, the rhetoric in the government-owned television channels. Um, leave no doubt uh, about that. So, so then the question becomes, um, at, returning to what I said, um, if the aggression is not punished but condoned and in effect rewarded, and you reward an aggressor if you if you let if you let them keep uh, what they seized, um, then the the uh, there is a you know a famous Russian saying by by. Um, Nicholas II, uh, Minister of Internal Affairs and Secret Police Chief Vyacheslav Pleve, about small victorious wars. Uh, now, that small victorious war with Japan did not, did not turn out the way they planned uh, in 1905, but 1904, 1905. But, but the point is that, that if, you, if you grant the aggressor um, uh, one victory after another, there is, there is a growth of confidence. There's a pressure. Um, and the problem is that, uh, to me, the greatest problem is that, that um, the growth of confidence and the domestic political pressures on Putin uh, may result in um, another small victorious war. All right, so two, two points, uh, hopefully amplifying what we talked about and what I, what I tried to get across. The first is concerns Russia. And I think it's become clear in over the last hour as we've had this conversation that what we're actually talking about is a false choice. We're not talking about whether to confront Russia or not to confront Russia. We're talking about whether to confront Russia over Ukraine or to confront Russia later. Mm -hmm. And so that means that resolve in the support of Ukraine and seeing Ukraine as a frontline state becomes enormously important. And the second point is, uh, the sort of the, the question of Russian hybrid warfare. Uh, Russia has spent a lot of time and energy and national capital on uh, inertia, on articulating the fact that, you know, uh, in seeding doubt in democratic institutions in the West, on uh, confusing the issue such that Western governments don't have a resolute response. In that context, what Ukraine has chosen becomes all the more remarkable. Mm -hmm. Because even as we're confused, over exactly which end is up, the Ukrainians don't seem to be confused. They seem to have made a very concerted choice, a choice in favor of the West, in favor of Europe and the United States, and against Russia. And that should be recognized, and frankly, that should be nurtured. Thank you. 
So I will go back to 30 years. The US strategic framework for Ukraine is Ukraine whole and free. It is not free and it is not whole. And we have to stick to that, to that framework and give the Ukrainian people every opportunity to see that aspiration. And I think that the most inspiring thing to me, as difficult as it was, when the Ukrainian election was held, President Poroshenko stepped down. A new leader, freely selected, was installed. And you cannot do that in Russia. And so that is why Europe, whole and free, must extend to Ukraine. Someday it must extend to Russia. Of course. And that's its greatest challenge. And of course, again, the American people must understand that US national security begins in Ukraine. And when you understand that that's where our security may lie, then you put a very important point on it. So those are the two messages that I'd like to refrain. Uh, I like to end on an optimistic note. Um, I, 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 John, I, Donald has to speak too. So. No, 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 no. Keep, it rolling, keep, keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. John, but my, John I, can't, I can't wait. <laughs> to. Um, to use an old Marxist term, I think that the. I think. Just you'll like this. I, I think that the correlation of forces in the current fight favors Ukraine and the West for the following reasons. This is where I, I may disagree with Alon. The war in Ukraine is a Kremlin war against the Ukrainian people, not a Russian war against the Ukrainian people. So Putin has two great vulnerabilities. One is that in the current circumstances, thanks to sanctions, the Russian GNP is losing 1 to 1.5% of growth per year. Over time, that's real money. And the impact on the Russian standard of living is greater. So Russia, too, is suffering from Putin's aggression. The second point is the Russian people don't want their soldiers fighting in Ukraine. So Russian casualties are a Kremlin political liability. Now, Ukrainians want the war to end, but not at the expense of their territorial integrity or their sovereignty. In other words, so they're not going to agree to terms which allow Putin's control of Donbass to exercise a veto power over Ukraine's security. As long as Western support remains strong for Ukraine, as long as the aid and the weapons flow to Ukraine, as long as the sanctions remain in place on Russia, Ukraine will win this war at relatively low cost to the United States. That's, that's the key point. And I hope as part of that, this institution will find a way before the year ends to sanction Nord Stream 2. Thank you. Uh, 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 optimistic or negative? I, I think the glass is half full and half empty. I very much agree with John's comments. But let me end on a commentary about Russia, which is that in the circles of which everybody at the table frequent, drink, eat, uh, you hear a lot of cliches. One of which is that Russia is back, and that's from the ostriches John described. The corollary is Russia is back, we must deal with it. Uh, both of which are very shallow and not very thought through. And the third is Russia is in decline, and that's the school I belong to. But for me, Russia, Russia's decline is probably, almost certainly, going to make it more aggressive, not less aggressive. And we've seen that all around the world. We, what was Maidan is now Syria, Venezuela, Central African Republic, where they get a lot of bang for their relatively few bucks. And this is going to continue. Uh, Russia in decline is more of a threat than Russia back. And, and, and that means we have to respond adequately. We have to not sub support Ukraine, as all of my colleagues and friends here have said, and not let it be the, the boy and the, the finger in the dike holding it back. Because if, he, if they don't succeed, and I agree with John, ultimately they will, uh, there's going to be much trouble elsewhere, and there already is. So it's a summon for all of us to respond a little more effectively and a little more coherently to what's going on and throw aside some of these cliches and these naive assumptions about either Russia's benign behavior or that Russia's back and somehow is has going to have their appetite satisfied because it's not going to happen. There's no at all evidence that that is going to happen. So that's... With that beautiful uh, s summary, I'm ending this panel. Thank you very much for your interest, and uh, let's eat.
Я думаю, что Heather и Лон мы с ними не Я знаю всех журналистов, поэтому не говори гоп, пока не I'm 
which targets the Arab-speaking Muslim world, which is something like, what, seven of the entire Muslim world, right? So, so you're like, you're not even looking at the proper target, right? So the way, you, so for example, if you're wrong, it's really the real thing terrorism, right? um, How much uh, are you using the VLA version service and their coverage? How much are they getting blue over from the NCDs? Like, how much are they doing fusion cells and, you know, are they like looking at me like I was crazy? I'm like, no, 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 this is like a real thing, right? So, so the other you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, um, Bob is, and he and I talk about this all the time, like, um, I don't, I, well, Sigma is not very transparent, but very okay. And so, like, if you're not ready to do it, like, it's very hard to understand. So you're in this weird situation where um, you have reforms that are written in the law, they were written in the 2017 NDAA, but nobody knows exactly what they're doing. I know they're changing the set. So, so, like, so, so, for your guys, and maybe uh, we're not hacking just how screwed up this is, because if you're going to rebuild, you have to rebuild at the command levels first. Yeah. 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 I think. Right, I'm, I'm stealing you. I know you're stealing. <laughs> I need you to steal. Oh, yes, thank you so much. So nice. No, 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 but I know it's really well. I know this whole... You want to you want to down like the link. I missed it, too, and I watched it yesterday. We're being pushed forward. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I'm trying to play. I thought it was great. No, no, I, 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 I thought you would be pushed that way because look, all the all the programs are, are sort of you know reoriented that way. But so I take issue with one part of his 
So do you know Michael Hoffman from CNA? He's a sharp dude. He's younger than Steve, but he looks, he's a smart guy. So I, I saw him the other the other night. Um, we were at a dinner together, and he made this point. He's like, look, yeah, I don't buy the whole Russia-China alliance thing. Not that they're not they're not aligning, but I don't buy the alliance. That's at the end. Simply because. China, is, Russia is not a revisionist power in Asia, it's a revisionist power in Europe, and China is a status quo power in Europe. So what you have is you have different theaters of, right, 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 different theaters of competition, right? Right. And they kind of go, okay, you got the Southern port, right. you got the North. Although I'm still stuck with the fact that, you know, uh, a Russia that's dying demographically, no, the Chinese oh, can be okay. for a long time feeding off the floor. That was the same dying thing in China. Right? And that has not been lost on the Chinese. That was the same for some reason. Because the demographics don't work for an equal partnership at all. All of our people, we are humble at the Atlantic Council, so that's why. Right. They're the ones that are That's right. That's right. Yeah, we're missing chairs. It's a good hour. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. Sure. I couldn't oh. understand any goddamn questions. His answer is really good. I figured. I knew. Seeing Brian McGurman, George Dyer. Yeah, he's moved down to South Carolina. Good for him. He like got the hell out of Dodge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it has just been T.D. Wyatt on leave for a bunch and a half. He comes in today and he'll start looking around like, hey, back your books up. We got to move. Wow. Nobody knows where the hell we're moving. Wow. So I yeah, think we're getting moved down to the OSAC. Yeah. 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 You know, when we do the seminar, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we think the three of us are being moved down there. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and whatever Jido was. Right, right, right. Ditra, IO, IO, A, E, whatever. Some ridiculous <laughs> alphabet suit. They got a, a simulation to try and figure out how the new parts fit together. So that's next uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday down at the OSAC. So, where the hell are we supposed to go with our books and crap? You'll see us with our coffee cup That's right. walking around That's the right. town. But no donuts. No donuts. No donuts. <laughs> <laughs> only, only we can pay for the donuts. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. But wait, wait, keep it posted once you figure it out. Yeah. Well, our, our email is just the same. Okay. I'm sure our goddamn phone is going to be on the show. Oh, yeah. But email is good. Email is good. Yeah. We'll see you here in a happy, happy holidays if I don't see you. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Enjoy uh, the 20th Hanukkah, right? Uh, 22nd, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It's, it's late.
Good afternoon. My name is Melinda Herring. I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Thank you for staying for part two. And this panel is going to be a little complicated because Senator Johnson is going to come in the room in seven to ten minutes. So we're going to pause our panel and our discussion and give the, the microphone to Senator Johnson. So please bear with us. But this panel is about the domestic reforms in Ukraine. Our question is, what can be done to ensure that Ukraine succeeds? Before we dive into the panel, we owe, I owe a number of thank yous. Ambassador Herbst and I have been thanked a number of times. We don't deserve the thanks for this. Uh, I'd like to thank specifically Nick in Representative Captor's office. He did an amazing job making this event possible. And I'd like to thank our staff, Shelby, Colby, Michael, Adrian, Doug, and Adair, and our events team at the Atlantic Council. You are phenomenal. Congratulations on a terrific event. Can you all help me thank them? <clears throat> terrific, thanks. So among heads of state, Volodymyr Zelensky may have the hardest job in the world. I don't know if you've had a chance to read Franklin Foer's excellent article that just came out in The Atlantic, but I really encourage you to take a look. Zelensky, of, of course, was elected on the prom, uh, a couple of promises this year. He was elected on the promise of bringing peace and prosperity and finally stamping out corruption in Ukraine. Of course, there's many obstacles to these goals. I made at least four, and Russia, Russia, Russia uh, it was at the top of the list. The other obstacles are obvious. Oligarchs and entrenched elites, a complex U.S.-Ukraine relationship, and waning support in Ukraine, as we've discussed on the first panel. Since he was elected, and since the parliamentary elections this year, there's been a huge amount of activity in the RADA. There's been a raft of legislation that's been passed, and frankly, it's been really, really hard to keep up with everything that the RADA is doing. Much of it is positive in my assessment. There's been a package of anti-corruption bills that have passed. There's bills that have made it easier to do, to do business as well. But Ukraine is still the poorest country in Europe, and the war has entered its fifth year. So our panel is really going to focus on the question of war and peace and on corruption and prosperity. Now, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce five terrific uh, top Ukraine experts and foreign policy thinkers. All the way on my right is Glenn Howard from the Jamestown Foundation, Jonathan Katz from GMF, Dr. Alina Polyakova from Brookings, Paul Stronsky, Dr. Paul Stronsky from Carnegie, and all the way on the left is Luke Coffey from the Heritage Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, sorry, the, 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 the other left. <laughs> don't, 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 we're not inferring anything. Luke, I'd like to start with you on, on this question of war and peace. Uh, can you please bring us up to speed and remind us how much the U.S. has given Ukraine in lethal and non-lethal assistance since 2014? What equipment and training have they given them specifically, and what else should we be giving? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you very much, uh, Melinda, for chairing this. Uh, and I want to thank the Atlanta Council uh, for uh, taking the effort to organize this very important event on a very important topic at a very important time. Uh, before I get into the details on, on what uh, the U.S. has done in terms of support, I just want to quickly uh, point out as a reminder, and I don't, need to tell, I don't need to tell this audience what I'm about to say, but I, I feel obliged to repeat it. We should not forget that it was in 2014, it was Russia that invaded Ukraine and not the other way around. Okay, Russia is the aggressor here. Ukraine is the victim. Uh, it, it, was, it is a matter of fact that a chunk of Ukraine that was recognized as the international community as being part of Ukraine is now not under their sovereign control. So that's why we're here today discussing this. That's the most important fact when it comes to Ukraine, is that this is a nation that's at war, uh, fighting for its survival, uh, it, it, Ukraine represents this idea in modern Europe today that sovereign nation states should have the ability to choose uh, how and by whom they are governed and which organizations and alliances they wish to join and no outside country should have a veto on that. So that's how we got to where we are today with Ukraine. In terms of U.S. Uh, support to Ukraine, uh, since 2014, the U.S. has provided, on average, just over $300 million a year in non-lethal uh, military, or non-military assistance. And during the same period of time, uh, has uh, granted Ukraine <clears throat> three separate $1 billion lines of credit loans. On the military side, 
the U.S. has provided uh, in terms of lethal and non-lethal military assistance since 2014, about $1.5 billion. And uh, of course, the eye-catching aspect of this are the, the javelins, but there's also more and less sexy but crucial uh, air, uh, capabilities we provided, such as secure communications, uh, UAVs, um, counter battery radars, um, sniper rifles, uh, <laughs> grenade launchers, uh, the, these sort of things. But I, I want to say that um, while th this is all welcome uh, for the Ukrainians, the most important thing the U.S. has provided the Ukrainians by this military assistance has been the symbolic value of America's support. Uh, in fact, there's not a single U.S. javelin on the front line in the Donbass today. But that doesn't matter, because what does matter is the message it's sent to Russia and to our European allies that we're going to provide the Ukrainians the most advanced anti-tank missile system in the world. And if they need to use it, they have it and we have Ukraine's back. So it's the symbolism. We shouldn't get caught up on the numbers and the capabilities. We have to remember in international affairs, symbolism matters, and that right now for Ukraine is probably the most important thing. Let me ask you a follow-up question. So the javelins were a really big issue for a long time, but have they actually changed the balance of forces beyond the symbolism? No, not right now. Uh, we, we have to remember um, when you fire off a javelin missile, it's essentially shooting a a Porsche in terms of the, the cost for one of these missiles, right? Um, and so these are very precious assets. And right now the front lines in Eastern Ukraine are relatively static. Uh, of course, uh, Ukrainian soldiers are dying on a weekly basis. Uh, they are fighting, but there has been no major push, uh, certainly no major armor push uh, to uh, change the, uh, the, the front lines right now. So. I would, I would still stand by my point that this is right now more about symbolism and it should always be remembered that Ukraine does have these missiles and has trained to use these missiles in case they actually ever need them. Thanks, Luke. The first panel talked a lot about NATO and some experts say that NATO can't count on, or I'm sorry, some experts say that Ukraine can't count on NATO membership anytime soon but NATO could still offer EOP status, enhanced opportunity partner status in NATO. Is that a good idea? And what would EOP status signal? Uh, certainly, any anytime you can advance that NATO-Ukraine uh, relationship, we should, including EOP status. Georgia has EOP status. Australia, um, uh, Jordan does. Uh, so it, you know these are serious countries, right? And Ukraine is a serious country in Europe. And all things considered, going back to the Bucharest summit where Ukraine was promised eventual membership into NATO, points to the direction that yes, uh, EOP should be um, given to Ukraine. But I, don't, I, I feel like sometimes we get too wrapped around the axle on you know, these acronyms and these terms and, and everything. We, we need to um, make sure that the Ukrainian path towards full NATO membership continues in the right direction. And, you know, it might be a long journey, it might be a bumpy journey, but it needs to continue down the right path. And, and one concern I have, not necessarily with EOP, but with some of these other um, initiatives like major non-NATO ally status, for example, I, I understand the appeal of something like this, but um, in terms of major non-NATO ally, the, the clue is in the name. Um, so it might, short term, it might sound great, but in the long term, you know, we don't want a major non-NATO ally with Ukraine. We want a NATO ally with Ukraine. So I think we have to be careful in how we look at these things. Thank you. Glenn, I know you've done a lot of thinking and looking at Ukraine's army and, and Navy. And the army itself has massively improved over the last five years. A lot of people have noted that, but the Navy remains underdeveloped. What more can the U.S. and Western allies do to shore up Ukraine's Navy? Beyond providing more boats, what kind of equipment and training would you recommend? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to come here today, Melinda, and thank you for your excellent job in moderating the panel. I'd also like to thank Ambassador Herbst for thinking of me and inviting me today. Uh, and for the Atlantic Council's leadership in trying to put this event together. Um, it's a great group of people. Um, I think the first thing you need to do uh, when we talk about Ukraine and the Navy is to try to fixate on what is the role uh, in American national interests. 
Now, you have to start, first of all, with history and start in, in, with the uh, annexation of Crimea uh, by Catherine the Great. After that occurred, Russia became a Mediterranean power. Now, why is that? Because Crimea became a, a very much a launching point for the, the Russian, uh, Russian Navy, the Tsarist Navy, and began a challenge in the Mediterranean. Today, there are up to six kilo submarines that are based inside the Black Sea. These submarines are, are moving back and forth through the, uh, through the Bosporus into the Black Sea, uh, from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. Uh, and they, these groups of, of subs are, are uh, trailing American carrier battle groups. Uh, so if you begin with the importance of Crimea, then you start to be able to fixate on what are American national interests and why it's a threat. Now, ever since, um, uh, now I, I, because I've talked a lot about and focused on the Navy, you know, it's very key important, you know, many people have always focused on Donbass, but they always get kind of sidetracked uh, and don't understand that even the basic symbol of the Ukrainian flag is a trident. Um, a very large percentage of, of, of Ukraine's littoral is, is uh, facing the Black Sea. Uh, as much as a quarter of the GDP of Odessa depends on sea trade. Uh, so it's a very, very critically important. And then you throw in the Sea of Azov and the agricultural exports, uh, then you put in the context of Mariupol. Now, the long and short of why what has ha been happening with U.S. policy has been they have in desperate need of trying to get a strategy. And they become, as many of us do, fixated on, on, on objects. Now, you heard Luke talk about the javelins. Well. Uh, we, Ukraine, for various reasons, um, because of the Poroshenko administration, was very much fixated on building its own indigenous uh, sh uh, gunboats and uh, shipbuilding industry, uh, decided at a late in the game not to try to, uh, to make use of the United States offering of what they call island-class patrol boats. Um, and only late in the game did the Poroshenko government uh, decide to go with this, but they finally did at the end of the day. Now, what we've seen is the rival within uh, and great uh, great pressure put on by many groups here in Washington um, was the pressure to try to get Ukraine to get these patrol boats. Why? Because the Gerza gunboats that they have are no nothing but a bunch of uh, uh, boats for your, for your backyard lake. They're not really the type of military weapons that, that one can try to use in a way to deter the Russians. The bottom line is if a quarter of Odessa's GDP or the Ukraine's GDP is coming from Odessa, um, you have no navy. There's no no one other than rotating groups of American uh, Aegis class destroyers and NATO boats, NATO uh, warships coming into the Black Sea uh, and rotating due to the Montreux Convention. So therefore, when they're not in town, uh, Odessa is wide open to the Russian navy. Now, the the problem increasingly now has become very quite desperate. Now, Melinda asked me for a recommendation with the delivery of the uh, the mar of the um, island class patrol boats now in Odessa. It's a great benefit, but the problem is they don't come with weaponry. So the, the key desperate thing that they need now, are hell, what they've been looking at, are Hellfire, uh, naval variant of the Hellfire missiles. And so these are, uh, Hellfire is also uh, located on the Apaches helicopters, but they also, there's a naval variant of that. And if they can give, the, give Ukraine these, uh, the Hellfire missiles, then that would allow Ukraine slowly to be able to build out from Odessa and protect the port and also challenge Russian uh, naval superiority in the Black Sea. Now this is, um, now th I know the discussion is underway, but this is not going to solve the problem immediately. But what is happening all across the seaboard uh, since May 2015, May 15, 2018, when Putin crossed the Kerch Strait Bridge is that Russia has increasingly applied what they call the bow constrictor strategy of slowly strangling Ukraine's economy. Because whether we like it or not, much of Ukraine's steel exports come, have to be exported by, by sea from Mariupol. Currently, there are wait times since they created the Kerch Strait Bridge and closed it off. The wait times have alternated between 73, uh, 73 hours up to 143 hours for ships waiting for transit through the Kerch Strait. So right, basically, it's, uh, it's basically Ukraine saying, mother may I, can I go through the Kerch Straits? And so Russia is using this type of economic strangulation uh, and a type of warfare on Ukraine that's very much impacting Mariupol. If Mariupol cannot cannot keep people employed and cannot produce steel and cannot export it, and it can't go by land. It's too, the steel exports are, are too much to go by, uh, to, by railroad. But if they can't get this, we're facing the, the, the death of Mariupol. Now, I looked at some of the economic statistics recently. Mariupol has lost 9.8% of its cargo turnover in 2018 compared with 2017. 
so far from January, June of 20 of this year, uh, they've lost 13.8%. So slowly, you're starting to see the death of Mariupol. And, if, and as long as this problem occurs, there, it's, going to, and it's going to be increasingly a problem. Now, way, the way militarily you try to do this is through the concept of sea denial capabilities. There's these gun, gears of gunboats that the Ukrainian Navy wants to transport and move to Mariupol and slowly be able to protect the port and be able to slowly edge out its capabilities. But the United States has to develop a, some type of military strategy uh, in the Black Sea that has some thought behind it and, and not one that's focused on Aegis class destroyers and carrier battle groups. Okay? The way the British and the French defeated the Russians in the Crimean War was through the economic strangulation of Sevastopol. That's the long and short of it, and it was done by sea power. Okay? And this is something that historians and military experts often forget, but this is really critical because when you look at the Odessa, and just exclude the fact that we're talking about Mariupol, ex look at Odessa. There's something called floating gas rigs that Russia has appropriated, took, seized from uh, uh, Ukraine when they invaded Crimea in 2014. There's one of these gas rigs is called the Tavrida gas rig. The gas rig has now 24.5 miles from Ukraine's Serpent Island. Now, why am I pointing this out? Because when you have a gas rig off the coast and the main shipping channel for all of Ukraine's maritime exports through Odessa, have to go through a narrow corridor of 24.5 miles between Serpent Island and the Trevrita gas rig. The gas rig is floating, it's weaponized, it's equipped with all types of air defense weaponry, and this thing keeps drifting out. And what the Russians are doing is what they call creeping annexation. And we're not paying attention to it, but this stuff is starting, and is starting slowly to, to diverge over. And we may wake up one morning, as we did uh, several months ago, when the Russians said, oh, we're going to have live firing exercises in, in the entire Black Sea region. So all commercial traffic in the Black Sea, get out. And whoa, I mean, what do we, so you have navies, you have commercial you know, ships, you have all these, all these things occurring and people are asking questions. But you could wake up one morning and the Russians have declared an exclusive economic zone around the Tavrita gas rig and suddenly uh, Odessa is wide open and everybody's going to be saying, oh, well, freedom of navigation, maybe we should think about that. Well, they thought about it. They thought about it for Kurt Strait, and uh, unfortunately, Admiral Fogo said, no, we're not, the U.S. Navy's not going to get involved. We're not going there. So, case closed. Okay, well, okay. And what are we seeing? Mariupol slowly dying. But now you're starting to see the case of this danger between Serpent Island, which is, it used to be part of Romania, and it's now part of uh, Ukraine. Um, it's a piece of rock, but pieces of rock can also, uh, like Gibraltar, can be very strategically significant. Now, why, this is, this, and this is where it requires some type of strategy, and the United States isn't putting a time and effort into that. For example, you have the strategic problem, the Montreux Convention, which restricts U.S. warships being able, in all non-signatory nations, the Montreux Convention, to have access to the Black Sea. They have to rotate in, in and out of, of the region. Uh, it was a 24-day schedule, I believe. And, but the problem here is that the United States needs to start thinking in Ukraine in a trilateral way about security of the Black Sea with Romania. Now, the problem is Romania depends a lot of its uh, trade through the Bosphorus, so it's kind of a little bit touchy about how it deals with Turkey. But the problem is, is through the Danube, you can create and deploy warships, uh, small warships that could become part of a, a rapid reaction force that could be uh, used to reinforce Odessa because when the way the U.S. Navy operates in the Black Sea is these ships are always in transit in the, Black, in the Mediterranean, but they're always keeping some of these ships uh, ready for deployment outside of the, uh, the Bosporus in the Mediterranean, ready to go into the Black Sea to protect Ukraine if there's a crisis when they're not there. But the problem is, is that it takes time, and, okay? And time is a problem in the Black Sea. We don't have 48 hours for wait on these warships sometimes because the Russians can strike any any chance they want into this region. Thanks, now, Glenn. Thanks. That, that, that's a terrific answer. And we're definitely going to look for you uh, to in, and watch your writing for the strategy because it sounds like you've done a lot of really good thinking about it. Uh, thank you for mentioning Hellfire missiles. Uh, Luke, you dodged my question before. Uh, he gave a very passionate answer or a very passionate explanation for why Hellfire missiles uh, should be one of the things that should go on, on the U.S. list. Uh, would you, is there anything else that, in terms of, of equipment uh, and training that you'd want to put on the list? You, you gave us a very full explanation of what we've done so far. 
Yeah, well, I would add um, lifting restrictions on U.S. service personnel operating um, uh, east of the Dnieper River. I think having uh, U.S. military personnel um, not embedded as combatants, but at least as observers, could better inform the debate uh, in the DOD about what the Ukrainians actually need on the front lines. And right now, U.S. troops won't go anywhere, can't go anywhere near the front lines. And this is the same for the defense of Mariupol, I would say. I agree 110% with Glenn. And I think that when the three ships were apprehended, um, well, almost a year ago to the date, in fact, um, the, the response from the U.S. was very lackluster. I would have had the commander of Sixth Fleet in Mariupol observing the situation, seeing what's going on to get an idea on what the U.S. needs to do to help Ukraine improve their maritime capabilities. So for sure, we often focus about the land component, but there are uh, maritime domain awareness uh, uh, capabilities that we should be helping Ukraine with. NATO should be doing this. Uh, for example, NATO has these trust funds that were created at the Wales Summit um, that focus on different capabilities for Ukraine. And I think it's time to hit the refresh button on some of these. They're underfunded. One of these trust funds is a counter IED capability trust fund for the Ukrainians. When's the last time Ukrainian soldiers have been hit by an IED? I mean, perhaps it's happened, but I don't think it happens all that often where they need a, a trust fund for this. But yet there's no trust fund for maritime domain awareness. Uh, so I think we need to has, take a step back and reevaluate five years on from the invasion what Ukraine needs right now, not what they needed in 2014. That's a great point. Thank you so much. So, uh, Paul, Alina, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. On December 9th is a really big deal. It's a really big date for Ukraine. All eyes are going to be fixated on Paris when the presidents of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany meet and try to find a way out of the war that Russia started. It's become a truism that everything depends on Moscow. What do the Russians want? What do the Ukrainians want? And what could Ukraine and the, the international community offer to incentivize them to finally get out of the Donbass? I'll start with Paul, then turn to Alina. Um, well, first of all, I think um, uh, this meeting is a win for the Russians. Um, the Russians have long wanted respect. They've sort of been uh, ostracized from, from the world, from the, from the Western world. Um, uh, and a big meeting uh, like this shows that, that Putin can still be influential, not totally isolated, um, and the sheer fact that it's happening uh, is good for the Russians. Um, uh, now the Russians certainly would like to have sort of, you know, they want the Ukrainians to give in to sort of recognize the self-proclaimed uh, entities as, as legal entities, to sort of bring them back in into a federalized system uh, that would give Moscow a lot of clout. Um, um, but if it doesn't get that, I think uh, Moscow is perfectly happy with the status quo uh, the way it is. It can ratchet it up, it can ratchet it down. Um, I think Moscow is still uh, trying to size up Zelensky and sort of figure out uh, you know, where he is and where he stands and how much leeway he has from the Ukrainian population. And he seems to sort of want to be sort of a peace builder and sort of de-escalate. Um, but but you know, what, is the, uh, what is the notion? Um, and then finally, you know, I think you know, I don't expect a whole lot. Um, I think we've been through this before. Um, uh, and I think we've seen um, these European leaders, you know, try to do this without great, great results. Um, but I just want to sort of uh, underscore that for Russia, I think, you know, a Ukraine that's struggling with its security means that it's struggling with its political reform. It's struggling with its economic uh, uh, reform. Um, and Russia really doesn't want um, a Ukraine that is, you know, a successfully democratic functioning Ukraine um, for multiple reasons, most of which is it's an alternate model for the region uh, overall. Um, and um, if there is a successful democratic change, we've already seen a democratic you know, uh, shift in power, which is tremendous um, uh, um, you know, in, in other parts of the world where everybody's voicing their concerns through the street. Here we have uh, a tremendous uh, positive result uh, through the ballot box. Um, so I think um, uh, if, if they can't get exactly what they want, um, uh, as long as they can get the status quo and be able to keep on turning that pressure on Ukraine um, and complicate its reform effort, uh, the Russians would be quite happy. Great. Thank you. Aline? Um, yeah, thanks so much, Melinda. And again, thanks to the Atlantic Council for um, organizing all of us uh, here today. Um, since you mentioned the December 9th meeting, um, this is the first meeting of this Normandy format uh, negotiations around the Minsk agreements, the first meeting, uh, I believe, since three years ago is going to be taking place. 
Um, and I think one thing that's different now than was three years ago is the U.S. was never officially at the table because of the Normandy format. Uh, but this year, um, and this, I think, pretty important meeting, uh, because the first one in, in over three years, we're really not going to be at the table. And I think it's critical that the United States continues to be engaged, not in an official way, but as we have been in the past through these informal channels that the Obama administration established, Trump administration also had, um, to continue to work um, our European with our European allies to make sure that this doesn't play into the Kremlin's interests. And my concern now is that if the U.S. is in fact absent from those negotiations in an informal capacity, uh, that we may not end up in, in a good place. Um, I think uh, Zelensky has pushed multiple times for better, for closer U.S. engagement. He's also pushed for the U.K. to take a more active role at some points. And in a recent interview, he also clarified kind of what they're looking for, meaning they're not looking to hold elections um, in the so-called LNR, DNR, uh, while there are still Russian forces on the ground, while there's still weapons on the ground. Uh, but it seems unclear that why Moscow would want to remove those weapons and remove those forces. Uh, the Moscow strategy is let's hold elections now, which would be akin to the Crimea referendum, quote unquote referendum, um, and that we give the special status uh, to those regions uh, without any changes um, on the Russian side. And I think this is, of course, untenable and um, very, very uh, problematic for the Ukrainians, but they seem to want to move towards the Minsk sequencing. And that means sequencing is really beneficial to Russia and really detrimental to Ukrainian interests. So I guess my hope for December 9th is that nothing happens. Because <laughs> that, be that would be probably the best outcome for Ukraine, even though that's not a great outcome. And the whole um, is better than moving closer and closer towards the Russian position. I think that's a lot of our hope. Alina, uh, just to push you a little bit, what options does Ukraine have? Is, is, the, is the best option just freezing the conflict and, and waiting it out? Well, this is such a touchy issue in Ukraine. There have been a series of protests in Kiev um, ahead of these meetings because the concern that some have in Ukraine is that Zelensky, in his desire to have peace, I mean, if he ran on any platform, that was his platform. It was no more war, I'm a peacemaker, and no more corruption, right, uh, without a lot of details. We're getting more details on that now, but I think the concern is that in his desire for a deal of some kind, um, that he will take steps that will actually be quite unpopular uh, among most Ukrainians. And there is a movement now to organize a series of protests right before December 9th um, in Ukraine to really signal that the population will not be behind him if he moves too close to fulfilling some of the Russian goals in the negotiation process. And so I think the reality is that there is no good outcome for Ukraine unless the Russians change their calculus and do something. And they're very unlikely to do that. Um, so I think the problem that we face is that, of course, the majority of Ukrainians uh, don't want to see those territories be completely cut off um, and to be these unstable gray zones on Ukrainian territory. Um, yet, it's not clear what the next steps would be. So I think we're going to be stuck with the status quo for a very long time unless there's a change from the Russian side. Thank you. One other question. You're, you're a Europeanist by training, and so I'd like to ask you about uh, the thinking of the French and the Germans. We understand why Zelensky is eager to sit down in Paris, but why are the French and Germans so eager now? I'm glad you asked that. I, I wanted to make one comment. Uh, we were talking a lot about why Ukraine is so important for U.S. interests, but of course Ukraine is far more important for European interests. Um, Ukraine is a European country. It is on the border with uh, EU members. It is the frontline state. Um, and the EU has done quite a bit to support uh, Ukrainian economic reforms um, and various other kinds of reforms. Um, and I think we forget that, that this is not just a U.S. priority, it's a transatlantic priority. Um, in terms of funding, uh, the EU as a whole has provided at least 15 billion in funding since 2014. That's a huge amount. And that doesn't take into account a lot of other programs and things on the ground that various EU member states in the EU has been funding in Ukraine. I just think it's important to remember that, that this is not just the U.S. Priority, transatlantic priority. Um, but I have my doubts about the current environment in France, and especially some of the comments that the president of France, President Macron, has been making. And again, this is why U.S. presence 
at the negotiating table is so critical because we've seen Macron, one, we all have heard the uh, NATO uh, brain death comment, uh, but that comment is, didn't happen in isolation. That comment is part of the strategic uh, shift or pivot towards a close relationship with Russia, um, which Macron himself has described as rebuilding some or rethinking some sort of new security architecture for Europe that includes Russia, while at the same time the EU is sanctioning Russia, while at the same time Russia has invaded European countries, not EU member states, but European countries, and continues to launch various kinds of information cyber warfare against EU member states, including his own campaign back in 2017. And so I'm really, really concerned about Macron's presence and his administration's presence at the negotiating table on December 9th, which is again why I said the best outcome will be no outcome. Um, I think the problem we face in the French-German dynamic is given the state of politics in Germany, Germany has taken a back seat to decision making at the European level. And that has left uh, the way completely open for Macron's um, temper tantrums uh, when it comes to NATO and then when it comes to the broader European security architecture. And I'm really, really concerned about these overtures to the Kremlin. Um, I don't know what he has in mind or why this has become part of um, the, the new strategy. Uh, it seems like the Elysee has been completely disconnected from the diplomatic core on this. Um, but I'm really concerned about it. And I think Macron is doubling down on it and that's really problematic. Where is it coming from, though? Is it business interests that are shaping his opinion? Uh, who's, who's, uh, how do you understand it? Question. Um, it's a great question to ask uh, some of our French analysts who are not here, um, who may have a, uh, a more um, insightful view into this. Uh, but my conversations with you, because I've been trying to figure out this question as well, you know, what is driving this? And the answer seems to be that it's um, driven by Juan Macron's frustration that he can't be the president of Europe that he's the president of France, um, and that he has been uh, incapable of building the kind of coalition you need to push through your vision for Europe, uh, because the Germans haven't been behind him, even though initially it seemed like there was this great relationship with Macron and Merkel um, that hasn't really panned down in terms of policy. Um, and I think he sees himself, you know, in this very French way as sort of the, the neo-Gaulist neo tra tradition um, as a great power that's at the table sounds familiar, um, you know, making deals with other great powers about the future of geopolitical order, and Russia's a great power. And there's no clear economic reason, um, given Russia's economic state, which is absolutely detrimental and in deep decline, for a country like France to have a more strategic economic relationship with Russia, which of course Macron has gone back to multiple times. Um, and I think what's driving it is probably a lot of ego, um, and probably a lot of frustration with the decision-making process in Europe, uh, where Macron sees himself as uh, being the president of the continent, but in fact, he's not. And I think that's probably a very frustrating experience for him. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alina. Uh, Paul, you wanted to hop yeah, in here. You know, I think I, I, I can never dismiss, um, you know, business interests, because I think, you know, particularly some French and, and Russian business interests are always, uh, are, are, are always there and always knocking on the door as they are throughout Europe. So I, I, I wouldn't totally um, uh, dismiss that. Um, I would very much agree um, with your comments about him being frustrated and frustrated. I think there's a lot of frustration within sort of the NATO alliance in general and sort of he's sort of seeing his role as perhaps, you know, leading a more robust Europe whether or not that will, will, will come um, is, is difficult to say. Um, I also sort of see, you know, this kind of suits um, uh, Russia perfectly well uh, because Russia is keen to stoke problems within the NATO alliance. It's keen to stoke problems within the European Union. Um, and we know that um, uh, NATO countries on the eastern flank are very unhappy with this initiative. NATO countries on the other side of the Atlantic are not very happy with this, interest, with this initiative. Um, so I think it, you know, it, it just causes problems broadly within the Euro-Atlantic community that doesn't, um, you know, that 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 he might not be fully thinking uh, thinking of, and just adds to some of the tensions that we already have um, uh, in, in NATO. Um, I would also agree. I mean, the French have had a long history of trying to sort of be the negotiator between Russia and the West. Uh, you look back at Sarkozy in 2008. Didn't go too well um, back in 2008, um, and I see sort of a lot of a, rep you know, repetition um, of that. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, Macron to me seems like he thinks he can deal with Putin. 
um, but I'm not quite sure. Um, Putin has been through, I think he's uh, the fourth French president Putin has dealt with. I think Macron was probably still in college when Putin came to power. Um, uh, and then you just look at the international leaders. I mean, he's been there. He's been through you know, four French presidents, four US presidents, five uh, British prime ministers. So Putin knows how to sort of deal with these people. Um, and I think um, having a much more co coherent, unified Western approach um, would really be uh, quite helpful as we move into this. And I don't see that happening yet. Uh, that I forgot to you have more to say about the French? <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Go I will just say that the, there is a domestic political component here. The French right, uh, which Macron constantly has to straddle, has always been, because Paul mentioned Sarkozy, has always had this pro-Russian or soft Russian kind of uh, tilt to it. And I think a lot of what Macron is doing now is also playing into that. Um, on top of that, we've also had the French veto over uh, fu future accession talks. Um, with regards to Albania and North Macedonia um, for the EU. And that has also now been part of this broader rethinking, strategic rethinking that's coming, I think, directly from the Elysee. Um, and I think that kind of skepticism about continued EU enlargement is not unwarranted. But when you take all of these things together, meaning uh, the NATO comments, uh, the pro-Russia comments, the veto on um, accession talks uh, with the Balkans, um, it's, it's starting to look um, deeply, deeply um, kind of isolationist uh, for France, meaning that I do think it's isolating France within the EU. And as Paul absolutely correctly said, that very much serves the Russian interest of further driving wedges, especially between France and Germany. Great. Thank you, Alina. Uh, did you have a comment on France? Because I want to go back to Ukraine. Okay, well, no, no. I mean, no? who could stop on the French? No, I, I just want to, I was going to make those two very points about the domestic politics in France and how, you know, I think a lot of us several years ago were looking very concerned that Marie Le Pen would win, that Macron comes in, sort of breathes life into, into French politics. Um, and I think he still is that bulwark. Um, and lest we forget, too, he's also been one of the few leaders who's really talked out about democracy, um, whether the French words match the actions. Um, that's a different story. And I 100% believe that the French government and Macron very much understand exactly who Putin is and what he has done. And so um, there's a lot of domestic politics. There's a lot of, um, of transatlantic challenges. And I think that, that that is feeding into this situation where you have a disjointed EU um, and a disjointed transatlantic relationship, which is impacting this. I would just say on the NATO front, if you look at the NATO summit declaration, for those people who are worried about it, and of course the French had a sign off on that, the door is still open, um, and that was part of the initial uh, sec I think it's within like the first paragraph of the London uh, Summit Declaration. So I think the French, despite some of these things, are still there, still in NATO, um, and still supporting the expansion of NATO in countries like North Macedonia. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, we're going to take a break now for Senator Johnson. Please help me welcome him. Talk loud enough, but this is, I get to hear me even louder. Um, because I haven't been part of this, this may be a little disjointed, but, but let me try and tell you why, first of all, I think Ukraine is important. Um, my own background, you know, I'd never been, traveled the world before I ever got in the United States Senate, but I'd never been to Ukraine. So uh, literally it was over Easter in 2011, first congressional delegation I ever went on, uh, visited Georgia, Ukraine, and then the Baltic states. And at that point in time, the, the issues were all about corruption. I think uh, T Timoshenko had been, you know, released from jail. Uh, the, 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 whole, the whole issue was uh, corruption in terms of the wheat markets uh, within the press. And it, you just take a look at, you know, all those ring nations, you know, the, the belt uh, between Soviet Union, former Soviet Union and Russia, 
and now Western democracies, uh, really the front lines. And all those nations were certainly trying to shed themselves of the legacy of corruption, trying to govern properly, follow the rule of law, uh, create the kind of prosperity their nations had the capability of providing for their, their populations. When you take a look at Ukraine, it should be the breadbasket of Europe. It should be incredibly prosperous. But, I mean, that's the same story across so many different countries of the world, but for decent government, but for the rule of law, but for the respect for individual rights and liberty and, and a free market system that allows people to aspire and create and build, uh, it doesn't happen. So as a private sector guy, you know, I, I take a look at that and I go, oh, there's so much potential there. And we want to support them. Fast forward to the events on the Maidan, which is extraordinary what happened. And my own interpretation is you had a group of individuals, obviously, that recognized the future, the economic future, obviously lied in the West. You know, Russia offers nothing, and this is a consistent theme whenever I'm, whenever I'm in Europe. Russia offers your populations nothing other than destabilization, disruption. Your economic futures lie with the West. Again, democracy, freedom, a free market system. So you had a group of, of Ukrainians that, that obviously wanted to integrate more with the West. And of course, Putin's puppet wanted nothing to do that. Obviously, Putin didn't want that. But what created the Maidan, again, this is my telling of the story, is then the young people who, who were tired of the lack of prosperity. I mean, you've got social media now around the world. People look, well, look at what that country, look at what those people have. Why can't we have it? You see that playing out in so many areas of the world, probably more of the world, you know, right now, Iran, for example. So you had young people who wanted what we believe is an unalienable right granted by our creator. They wanted that for themselves. And so they joined, they combined with the more political part of that, and you end up with the extraordinary events on the Maidan. Uh, I unfortunately did not go with John McCain. Senator Murphy did, and, and we're actually on the Maidan with hundreds of thousands of people at night in the cold, feeling that pulse of the desire for freedom and liberty. I was there a few months later when we walked the Maidan after the slaughter, seeing the memorial, seeing the bullet holes in the, in the lampposts. And so, to me, Ukraine is important, first and foremost, because it's a modern day birthing of a nation. I know, I know Ukraine is old, but the new Ukraine is new. And it's a country that is trying to shed itself of the, of the corrupt legacy of the Soviet Union. It, it is a country where the people are yearning to breathe free and, and to take advantage of what prosperity their land and their nation and their economy can really provide. And I think Americans want to support that. It's, it's 240 years later than our own birthing, but we've gone through that. We're still going through it. What are the words of the Constitution? To form a more perfect union. We're far, away, we're far away from that. The division of this country is incredibly unfortunate. But we're still struggling. Freedom is not easy. It's hard. So ju just as a freedom-loving human being, I have a great deal of empathy and sympathy for the citizens, the, the people of Ukraine, that delivered an unbelievable mandate to President Zelensky, who I believe is the real deal. Complete political neophyte, as I am, as was President Trump. We have an affinity toward that, recognizing the long knives come out very quickly, and it's very difficult to find anybody you can trust within the political environment. So here you have a young man who has made the statement. He, he, he realized this, this election was not about me. This election was about the people of Ukraine. This election was about what they desire, a corrupt, free, or certainly a less corrupt nation. And he understands that mandate. So to me, Ukraine's important just because of that. I sympathize with freedom-loving people just wanting what everybody in the world basically wants. Safety, security, some measure of prosperity, the ability to raise your family in hopefully a better country in what, than what you grew up in. Isn't that what everybody aspires to? And it's really, from my standpoint, what America represents. 
Yes, we have a strong military and we sometimes need to project that power, but what we primarily need to project is the idea and promise of America. What this country writes, I, I, represents, I always talk about the vision statement in our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that these are God, our creator granted rights. That's what we need to project. That's why Ukraine is important. Now you throw into that mix the fact that it just happens to be the ground zero in our political competi or competition with a thoroughly corrupt regime that is Russia under Putin. And we can't allow Russia to become more and more aggressive. And Putin is incredibly opportunistic. And if we don't help Ukraine, who's going to? So. Uh, So, so that, that's my primary me message. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, that this this debate has, in, in some respects, with what President Trump's concern about providing the military aid, which, by the way, he provided the Javelin missiles, they were in place, they deterred further aggression. Uh, I certainly think it's very unfortunate this debate blew up into the public, where the sausage-making process, in this case of foreign policy, was fully exposed. It didn't have to be. It's not helpful. There's a lot of damage being done to our democracy right now because of this exposure. President Trump felt he had to release the transcripts. What world leader is going to feel comfortable being candid with any future American president? We are weakening executive privilege. I know I'm a member of the Senate, but I have a great deal of respect for the executive branch and the ability for a chief executive, the President of the United States, to get candid advice from his advisors as well. We need to understand the damage is being done to our democracy in this process as well. We were well on our path to completing that sausage making process. If not within the executive branch, and by the way, when I was in Ukraine with Senator Murphy on, on September 5th, the first thing that President Zelensky asked us is, okay, let's put, it, put, put set aside the, the diplomatic talk here, what's happening with the aid? Because I'd just spoken to the President, I laid out what the issues were. I was unsuccessful at getting President Trump to give me the authority to say the, the, the hold has been released. But it was about corruption. And it was about lack of or insufficient support from the Europeans. That, those are the reasons. But I, in that same meeting, I said, let's be unified. Let's not blow this out of proportion. Let's not make this a big deal. The truth of the matter is there are deficit hawks in the administration. I know them. They're looking at the end of the fiscal year, this money hasn't been spent. There's all kinds of money that hasn't been spent. What can we save? If, if President Trump doesn't release the hold, no big deal. Senator Murphy's on appropriations. You know, Congress will, re, re, will remedy this. A few weeks from now, we'll appropriate the money and not give the executive any option whatsoever. So within the, within the executive branch, between the, the two branches of government, this sausage-making process is being resolved. It ended up being resolved on September 11th, okay? Now, again, I know there's all kinds of controversy. There's all kinds of, you know, the worst possible construction put on everything said. But coming from a business background, I was in manufacturing. You're solving problems all the time. The first question I'd always ask myself when I confronted a new challenge, a new problem, was, is there an opportunity in this? Can something good come out of something bad? Generally, there is. And I would say in this case, and I'll conclude my remarks, remarks on this point. In this case, although this has not been good, in this case, we can utilize this to convey to the Ukrainian people, first of all, congressional support. I think they, they realize almost universally within the administration, the administration's support and hopefully the American people support for the courageous people of Ukraine that stood up against Vladimir Putin and his puppet and yearned to be free and more than 100 of them lost their lives in that courageous effort. And as Americans, we should support that time and time and time again, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Iran, whether it's in Hong Kong. That's who we are, we're a compassionate nation, that's how we provide the kind of leadership that I think this world is craving for. Thank you much.
that was well put that the pulse for freedom and liberty is still alive and well, and the fight is still on in Ukraine. And that's a perfect transition to the domestic picture. We're going to move from Paris to Kiev, Ukraine. So uh, we've heard uh, Senator Murphy and Senator Johnson have both said uh, Vladimir Zelensky is the real deal. I'd like to ask Jonathan and Alina, I want to turn to Jonathan first. Jonathan, do you agree with this assessment? What do you make of him so far? So we've talked about the platform he was elected on, and he talks a big game uh, on corruption. Uh, but he also has done some weird things that aren't necessarily in line uh, with his talk. He appointed Andrei Bogdan as his chief of staff, and he keeps playing footsie with Ihor Kolomoisky. At the same time, he has done good things. Activists praise his appointment of Prosecutor General Ruslan Rybashovka. How do you understand these contradictions in Zelensky? Well, I, I think you. Um, I think you. Early on, you mentioned that the the Rada in particular. And let's 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 step back. President Zelensky was elected last spring. A new Rada was elected this summer. Took office in September. So we're about three months into um, into a new Rada and really a new government and. Uh, and I think they came out very quickly, passing a number of reforms, some that were um, you know, widely praised, including the, the lifting of parliamentary immunity that still needs to go through um, the legislative process. And I think for many people, yeah, there's a lot of hope in President Zelensky, but more so if you're looking at the polling numbers, um, when you look at how the Ukrainian public views what's taking place, and almost in an unprecedented way in terms of support. So President Zelensky, his promises were both on anti-corruption. He also made a promise on the Donbass. And I think part of the conversation that we're having here uh, about the Donbass is also about his wanting to ensure that he follows through politically on that, on, on, on that uh, promise. But also, I think, an understanding now, I think even with the protests that were mentioned, that it's a more challenging issue to resolve domestically, politically. And let's not forget. Um, that similar type of pressure was uh, put on uh, Mr. Poroshenko as well. And as we all recall, there was a deadly uh, incident in front of the RADA where people were killed. There was a grenade attack. Um, it's, it has been, it's a very difficult domestic political issue, rife with a number of challenges politically amongst different groups. Um, and one of the things I, I admire, which we're, we, we really haven't focused on today, is, is President Zelensky's efforts in the Donbass, not on necessarily just the resolution, of the conflict, but really reaching out uh, to those in the government-controlled, non-government-controlled areas, uh, opening up new bridges, uh, creating people-to-people -people contact, uh, which means that even if there's not a deal now, and I associate with Elena, I'm hoping in this case um, a bad deal, you know, is 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 not acceptable. Um, hopefully, the U.S. and others will be standing with the Ukrainians um, in in the strongest possible way to ensure that a bad deal doesn't happen. But I think what he's doing is laying, I think, a very important ground uh, groundwork and laying the groundwork for engagement between those who are on both sides of the Donbass, getting down to the people to people. And I think that's something that, that's been seen. There was a great economic uh, conference held in Mariupol to raise concerns about what's happening there. And, you know, It doesn't replace the ability to conduct the type of trade they should because of blocked or clogged or waterways that Russia won't let uh, Ukrainians do uh, uh, their transportation or economy or trade through. But it's really important, and I think we should be praised for that. So he gets high, high marks right now for doing that. I think the areas where we, there are some concerns of what you laid out, which is who is he bringing, who is he surrounding himself with? And I think we're all aware of one really sort of major elephant in the room, which is Privat Bank his relationship with uh, Mr. Kolomoisky, an oligarch. You mentioned, I think earlier, someone mentioned earlier, when you start to look at the list of things that have an impact on the Ukrainian leader, and, and this is not the first go around. I see Ambassador Herbst, you've been through various leaderships that promise reforms, but then get caught up in the same, uh, same process again, where you have invested uh, political and economic interests that have uh, ended up, uh, even in the most promising of circumstances, whether it's the Orange Revolution or post-Maidan. And so with Mr. Zelensky, this is a real opportunity. Now, the question is whether or not oligarchs will, you know, that are still out there, that haven't left, that claim that they will reclaim Privat Bank again, like Mr. Kolymoisky, will win the day. And I think that's the, that's the $10 million question. It's the question that the IMF 
has been uh, discussing with him. It's disconcerting to see the attacks on those of the National Bank of Ukraine. It's unacceptable. Uh, they need to have protection. Those who are responsible should be brought to justice. Um, and it's quite clear who is responsible and behind these attacks. And so Mrs. Zelensky, I think even over the next couple of weeks, fulfilling all the reform legislation that exists, not just in the first passage of the law, but in the second passage as well, is gonna be critical. He is taking the right steps in a number of areas, but the proof will be not only in the passage of the laws, but the implementation. And I have seen, just as somebody who oversaw um, USAID projects back during the Obama administration, we saw many great laws passed. Um, but they were not implemented. New anti-corruption bodies stood up, but were blocked from being able to carry out their duty. Um, and it's not lost, and I think it was Senator Johnson who mentioned uh, seeing the bullet holes in the Maidan. Uh, the lack of prosecution of those responsible for the deaths of those during the Maidan um, is reprehensible, and that needs to be addressed. Or the attacks on civil society, where nobody's been brought to justice, unacceptable. So there's a lot of important things that, that this government, um, I'm a glass half full with Mr. Zelensky, but this is, the reforms are not short term. These are all, this is a long term effort. And just so I, I wanna add this, and I don't wanna <laughs> monopolize, the American component to this, and what you've done today, and I wanna thank you for hosting and Atlanta Council for leading and all, everybody who's participated, all the think tanks, I think it really shows the strong support for Ukraine and Washington and I think there would probably be many more organizations who would have loved to place their, their names in support of this. But the U.S. support is really critical. I'm happy to hear that the senator, the senator mentioned that. Um, maintaining the funding and assistance levels for Ukraine is incredibly important. Not just a one-year funding level, but multi-years. This will be a multi-year process. And so doing that, the U.S. is, is the second largest provider of assistance in Ukraine, maintaining those levels are important. And that's why you know, that joint, that bipartisan support, congressional support has been critical, um, especially if you have executive branch that may seek to cut assistance, not just based on sort of the political moment of Ukraine, but more so on, on the issue we don't believe in foreign assistance. Let's go, that's a, a, a deeper issue. But I do think that for Ukraine, and I, I, I wanna just sort of add this, the US example um, of rule of law of democracy, of respect for that is critical. And having the ability to engage the Ukrainians um, in a, a voice that backs up what we say is important. And so I only think that as we have a process in Washington right now, some may agree, some may disagree, it's so important to actually show Ukrainians and the world that we do have a process that upholds the rule of law regardless of political party or who's in charge. And I think if we lead by example, because we are not perfect as a, as a nation, I think that's really important. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. In Zelensky's latest interview uh, in Time Magazine, he mentioned that U.S. support for Ukraine is just incredibly important, exactly how you said it, uh, because it affects everyone else. So I think that's a really important point. Alina, what's your take on, on Zelensky? Is Jonathan right? Are the senators right? Or do you see other, uh, something else? Uh, no, I mean, I tend to agree with what Jonathan uh, laid out. Um, you know, he is still very much an unknown, I think, in his own thinking view of the world, but we're learning much more about that, not just in his public um, commentary and the interviews that he's doing, but um, I really found it refreshing that at one point he did this very informal uh, in, uh, marathon with journalists at a cafe in, in Kiev, and they could just come and ask him questions directly, and... I think that was unprecedented. I mean, you can't really imagine, obviously, any world leader, uh, the president of a country doing that. Hold on a second. That, that's impressive, but he also refuses to talk to, talk to the press and only gives interviews, interviews sure. uh, to people he knows and uh, gives pre-canned Facebook uh, interviews. That's not real press freedom. Well, I'll let you, you I, I, this was not a commentary on press freedom. It was more a commentary on his personality. Sure, sure that I can't imagine any other president doing that. Sure. And we can debate whether he's actually answering the questions or evading them like many most politicians do, um, you know, and to what extent he's actually out there and, and having the hard debates. Uh, he isn't in the way that he could be, uh, but I still think it is a reflection of how he thinks about um, himself in this role. And it's very different than we've seen Absolutely. before in Ukraine. Um, and that, that was a 
a point that I was trying to make. I think, on, on the other hand, um, you know, we've seen this huge flurry of activity that you mentioned from the RADA, um, and, and Jonathan talked extensively about that. But I think right now Ukraine has the opportunity to really set itself to be on this path to becoming the model country for post-Soviet transition, right? Um, we post the, the era of the Soviet Union ended a long time ago, um, especially in Ukraine in 1991, but we haven't had a gener generational shift until now. I mean, I think we forget that. He is the first leader who doesn't come from the old guard, right? And we kind of had the old guard going back and forth for the entirety of Ukraine's independence. So I think this is such an opportunity for Ukraine. And I think he embodies that opportunity. And he will make mistakes, and he has made mistakes. And not everything that Rada has done has been great, as you all know. Uh, but they have passed this large anti-corruption package um, that tries to relaunch some of the institutions um, that had kind of gone dormant or were paralyzed and highly politicized and blocked from doing their job on investigating and pursuing cases of uh, high level and political corruption. So the privatization of state industry, this is huge. It's huge. Um, and the RADA has passed this. And we'll see what happens on land reform, but that would be a huge thing um, as well that no other Ukrainian government has been able to get through. Um, so I think Ukraine has an opportunity to emerge as a model of what a successful post-Soviet transition can look like and get out of this hole that it's in in terms of being the poorest country in Europe. I will just mention that um, you know, Senator Johnson's comments were right on, except that Ukraine is unique um, in terms of its transition to democracy because of the Russian invasion, right? Because it has an active war. I mean, so does Georgia, but we can't really say that about a huge number of countries across the world. And that is uh, stifling and stymieing its ability to develop and grow for obvious reasons. Um, I think lastly, I will just say to follow on Jonathan's comment on the bipartisan support for Ukraine and the fact that we have all of these um, institutions represented here and we've had such great bipartisan participation from members of Congress. Um, but I think that needs to be followed up with some action. Like it's great to have these conversations, but I would really like to see a bipartisan a statement renewing the commitment to stand with Ukraine, right? At this critical mo moment, I think that will send a really strong message that despite our politics, the policy is still um, going in the right direction, right? And since we are in Congress, um, I hope that's a message that uh, those of you who may be staff uh, can relay um, to your bosses um, and think through because that would send the clearest symbolic message. Um, you know, as uh, I think Luke said earlier, symbolism really matters in the world of international relations. And that would be a very, very powerful symbol um, to get through um, Congress today. Fantastic. Thanks, Alina. I think there's interest in that, and we will definitely uh, be in touch with all the, the various think tanks uh, to put something very robust together, and we'll look for your leadership as well. Uh, Jonathan, uh, another question for you. You went to uh, judicial reform. Let's dig in a little bit there. Everyone knows, it doesn't matter who you talk to, that courts are the most important reform uh, that affects FDI. It affects uh, it basically it affects the the economic picture. Uh, it, it affects whether people want to stay in Ukraine or leave. That's a brain drain is another uh, big issue in C Ukraine as well. Now Zelensky has just passed a new ju judicial bill that and a package of anti-corruption reforms that Alina mentioned. How good are they? Well, these reforms, if they're implemented, I take your point. If they're implemented, finally assure investors that their money is safe and deliver impartial justice. Yeah, I, I think these are all really uh, important steps forward. And if you're an investor, I think maybe some of the things that you're most worried about is that is the is the implementation uh, implementation part of this too, and whether or not um, you, you're going to want to see um, courts reform courts. You're going to want to see uh, the type of judicial reform in the sense of who are the judges. Um, if you're looking at laws, whether or not the prosecutors are able to prosecute uh, in an economic case that your money that you're investing in Ukraine is safe. And so if I was an investor, Ukraine is incredibly promising. I think if somebody mentioned with both human resources, um, natural resources as well, uh, but you're still concerned about whether or not the reforms that are being passed. So, like if we're you know if we're using football analogies, we're getting you know 20 yard line. You've got a lot of ways to go, and 
I know that, uh, for example, Georgia is a good example of a country that has spent a lot of time looking at the World Bank ease of doing business and addressing the different uh, the different uh, criteria in that, and then moving significantly down, in fact, as a space for countries to do business in. And I know that is part of what the Ukrainian government is looking to do right now. But you still see, in certain areas like agriculture, you st still see vested interests pushing back. The thing I'm more concerned about goes back to pre-bank, which is even if you are critical of, of Poroshenko, uh, one thing in his government, one thing that they worked to do was to address uh, the challenges in the banking sector um, and what the corruption and sort of basically either, you know, t they either took over certain banks or those that were sort of ended. And I think the stability in the banking sector is particularly important for Ukraine. It was a success, and that's why I brought up Privat, Privat Bank, which is, you know, some thought or idea that Mr. Kolomoisky would then return as the, the owner of Privat Bank after, one, using it for his own interest, two, bilking, uh, Ukrainians out of billions of dollars um, and then to receive it back after that bank was bailed out by international partners on top of that to me is the ultimate in chutzpah which I know Mr. Kolomoisky knows about um, and so I would just I would just hope that that um, that you know that when we start thinking about judicial reform we also look at sectoral reforms energy sector reforms agriculture as well and just to make certain that, that the United States and international partners, even if as distracted as they are, are really holding these conditionalities um, to bear uh, when it comes to these things. Because Ukraine's economy is still fragile. Uh, and we all remember what it was like in 2014 for those of us who worked on the macroeconomic account of engagement with Ukraine. The economy was on the verge of collapse. The international community came in. Um, and there were certain conditionality that Ukraine had to fulfill, and one of them was to address the, uh, the banking sector, the problems in the banking sector, to fix those. And so any hint of that going in the wrong direction is it gonna be a bad signal to investors and to Ukraine's international partners, and it, could, it has an impact not only just economically, but on your Atlantic track as well, because it's the fundamental of upholding rule of law and it will be, I think, the quintessential issue for Mr. Zelensky, who has a relationship with Mr. Kolomoisky, uh, if he remains strong on this. And I think if he's truly a, a servant of the people, then he'll hold firm. Okay. All of that's true, Jonathan, but is Zelensky going to cut a deal with Kolomoisky over Privat Bank? How, how, do, how, does he, how does he get out of this? Um, he yeah, he holds, holds firm. He holds firm. Um, I think his, his international partners are saying, don't do this. I think it's quite clear what he has to do. And I remember the hemming and hawing, too, of what took place in the previous government on Privat Bank, too. It took a lot of effort to get Ukraine to where it is. That's why a distracted United States, a distracted EU, a distracted partners of Ukraine um, is not good because right now the pressure needs to be there at the highest level of the U.S. government on the gov on on Zelensky not to do this, but there also has to be support and return. And the things that worry me is Zelensky saying, "I don't trust anybody yeah. in the international community. I don't I trust the United States. I don't trust the French. I don't trust, you know." So we need to we need to work at rebuilding that trust with him as well. Uh, but but part of that will be how do we support the economic growth going forward? There's a number of different ways the U.S. can do that. Um, whether new macroeconomic support would be needed as part of a, of, of a IMF package, uh, whether we're talking about trade, enhancing trade and cooperation through various means. The U.S. has other tools, and we should be looking at those tools, even as we're looking at sort of these ideas of how to support Ukraine. I would go further than a resolution. I do think that another type of Ukraine Support Act, uh, building on the initial, taking the initial um, uh, you know, funding levels that, that are there, taking into account all the progress that's been made in various sectors, and retooling it to a Ukraine in 2019, 2020, versus to what Ukraine uh, looked like in 2014. 
Jonathan, I, I, I take your point. Uh, I think it's harder, it's easier said than done. And if if Zelensky says to hell with Kolomoisky, he's going to get blasted. Uh, and we got local elections coming up. I mean, I think you're right fundamentally, but uh, there's a, definitely a political calculation there. But I would just say that even, even a deal that provides some type of monetary relief, and people say that Kolomoisky will never go for anything but full return, to me is... I would think for the Ukrainian public would be a sellout. How can you, you know, handing more money over to somebody who already took billions seems to me um, to be to be almost criminal. And so I think I can't speak for Mr. Zelensky. It's a tough situation, but stick to his guns, um, and you know, and recognize that when you make tough political decisions, there's going to be some fallout. And eventually, at some point, I understood that they, Mr. Zelensky, had a certain honeymoon period in which he wanted to move legislation forward. But none of these things, he can't predict all the things that will happen. He couldn't predict um, the things that have happened over the last couple of months. And it's about you know him maturing in this position and taking some tough decisions. Sure. And his numbers are, are actually starting to slide now. We're, we're starting to see the end of that honeymoon. Paul, I think you wanted to jump in on, on Zelensky. Turn on your microphone, please. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing that I was, that I was mentioning is, is you know, I, I would agree with Jonathan. I mean, I think he needs to stick to his guns um, because you know, his numbers have been very high. He's had legitimacy, and he's only going to lose that legitimacy over time. Uh, and so the sooner he does this and the sooner he deals with, you know, tries to address Colmoise, it's going to mess up the entire sort of you know, shady political system that's behind the official political system, but I do think that that, that needs to be done, um, uh, or else it'll be too late. Um, uh, and I think, you know, there is a history of uh, in Ukraine, and I think, you know, we have somebody who's got uh, tremendous uh, personal legitimacy right now, who's got uh, tremendous legitimacy in the RADA, um, who's got a lot of power still, um, uh, and so now's, now's that time. Um, uh, to really try to deal with it, and I think now is the time where the United States, our European partners, but I think the United States across the board, in the administration, in Congress, really needs to sort of make that very clear um, in, in any way um, it has. Um, and, and then the second bit, you know, I think um, I think we do need to recommend, you know, recognize that he does have a lot of time now, but he really does need to get to work. And another bit was not just cur curbing corruption, but people want a, a better life. Um, uh, and so things like agricultural reform might help, you know, give some better, you know, better lives. Um, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things, improving services, um, uh, you know, making local governments more accountable. All of these types of things that are there um, uh, uh, are things that he really needs to work on. Um, and he's got strong partners right now in um, uh, Ukrainian civil society. It's one of the most impressive civil societies I've seen in the former Soviet Union, um, the former Soviet space right now. It's a model. Um, I go to Ukraine, I've gone to um, Kazakhstan, and they all look at what's happened in Ukraine over the past 10 years and see that as where they want to go. Um, and so I think you know, he's got a lot going for him, um, uh, but I think he needs to use his legitimacy um, and you know, be aware that he's going to take some hits and his, his polls are going to go down, but if he's successful, you know, it, it'll be good for him and it'll be good for Ukraine in the long run. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Luke and uh, Glenn, did you did you want to weigh in on Zelensky at all? No. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, I uh, getting back to the United States and the Paris meeting. I think that um, whatever Putin's strategy is, uh, the role of the United States here is we faced a very large setback with the loss of Kurt Volker, um, and Kurt's presence is something they call st strategic mentorship. And, and Kurt was trying to instill in the Ukrainian government uh, and in Zelensky, I think he took to great effect, he stiffened their spine. And I think with the loss of, of Kurt, that we have to find a way to keep stiffening Zelensky's spine uh, with some type of influence. Now, what I would be looking for is somewhere along the lines in the next, in the next day or two before the Paris meeting, but is to have a phone call from Pence uh, to kind of, you know, encourage Zelensky uh, and, and show the U.S. support, or Pompeo. And, and I think that would go a, a, great, a, great, go a great way in helping kind of to deal with the Macron factor uh, and letting these meetings not sensibly become just the Macron show. But I'm also more worried about Putin's salami tactics because with each meeting and each, each phase of, them, of Ukraine accepting uh, the Steinmeier formula, in some form, some, some shape, uh, is leading, what I fear is leading from one meeting to the next. 
with each step kind of further re-endorsing, re re-entering the whole concept of direct negotiations with Donbass, which is Putin's end game. Now, we don't know what, what's going to come out of the meetings, but even if we don't see anything and there's going to be another round of meetings, it's again, it's progress and the effort of trying to create the impression that Russia is slowly uh, agreeing as it uh, to, uh, to a rapprochement with Ukraine, that some type of end deal is in, in underway. We saw the return of the Gears of gunboats that were given back to uh, Ukraine recently. Uh, you know, that got a lot of uh, visibility and publicity in Europe. So that's what really um, is worrying me and wondering what's going to come out of the big what if of the meetings in Paris. Uh, and what is going to be the future U.S. role in this? Because we do play a role, and when our, our role is to f either clone Kurt or find somebody close to him. Uh, and so we got Ambassador Herbst over here. Uh, I'll, I'll, He's he gets, busy. Sorry. He, uh, we need gets, him. He gets my vote. But, but we have to find someone of Kurt's stature, uh, and that's, you know, to, to really help Ukraine and mentor them. And, and in this process, because we've got to play a role, and, I, and that's what worries me a lot. So I'll end on that note. Thank you. That, that's an excellent way uh, to conclude this. So I'd like to just go through the panel to summarize what you said. So uh, a call from Pence would be helpful. Uh, Hellfire missiles, a new Ukraine Support Act, and looking at, at the assistance figures, an attitude of tough love and mentorship. Uh, and a new Kurt Volker. Uh, is, is there anything else on the list uh, it, it, that you guys would want to put on the list for Congress to consider? Just, just one other thing. I mean, we have, we, when we talk about Ukraine, we, we talk about politics, we talk about geopolitics, but sometimes we forget the human costs of what's going on in Ukraine. Um, the you know, tremendous number of people who've been killed, the tremendous number of people who've been displaced, and the tremendous number of people who experience extreme hardship. And I think as we have these conversations about geopolitics, Putin, you know, what we can do, I think we also need to remember that there is a, horrible, uh, a horrific situation going on um, in those communities, and, and we need to make sure that we can help those, those communities in addition to sort of the bigger picture as well. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, I, I would say patience. Uh, the reforms we're seeing in Ukraine are generational. It will be a generational change. It's going to take time. Uh, reforming your economy, your system of governance, your military, your security services, your courts, all while fighting a war is kind of like building a boat while you're already out at sea. And we need to understand that Ukraine is going to face many challenges along the way, and we should encourage them, but we shouldn't expect things to just improve overnight however frustrating that might be for us. I'm not sure how to quantify patience, but I, I've added it to the list. Al Alina, Jonathan, Glenn, anything else? Well, I think if we get all of the things on that list, that would be amazing. Um, so I would just uh, uh, double down on that. But uh, I think on, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's re so critically important. I was mentioning earlier more opaque and less direct terms than Glenn um, about U.S. presence and U.S coordination with our allies and Ukrainians and the Russians. And that's exactly what we lost with the loss of a special envoy. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that channel was maintained in the previous administration as well by Toria Newland, And that was then passed on to, to Kurt, more or less, to, Kurt, to Ambassador Volker. Uh, and I, I think this is going to be a very difficult position to fill, unfortunately. But someone has to have that portfolio. Uh, because otherwise, Ukraine is sort of left rudderless, I think. Um, in a very increasingly problematic geopolitical negotiating environment that we're going to see unfold in just a couple of days. Jonathan? No, I just, uh, more, more of this, more of the bipartisan focus. I think it will require um, a real effort to keep people focused on issues versus the political, you know, sort of whirlwinds all around. And I think if you do that, then um, that will probably, to me, is the most helpful thing to do is just to get people back on track, fo focusing on issues, focusing on how to work with, with partners like Ukraine. Um, thinking out of the box on the congressional side, I think, is helpful because if you have a, a marker that you can set as to what Congress wants to see happen or the administration over a number of years, that's going to be most helpful to um, establishing the, the baselines. I want to think about Ukraine 2025 you know, as a vibrant democracy well on its way. Uh, to, to NATO membership or the EU, um, you know, and the United States central to the engagement, the same type of engagement that was critical to putting sanctions in place, that's been critical before in a number of diplomatic settings. That's where you need to get back to. 
Um, and not many people mention sanctions here, but that's also one area where, you know, sort of looking, re-looking at the, the sanctions related to the Donbass, taking a look at those related to Russia. Please remember Crimea in this process as well. Um, sometimes you see Normandy and it's almost as, as if the Crimea situation doesn't really exist in the diplomatic conversations. Um, but I think it's incredibly important because that was uh, precedent setting, illegal, um, and it has to be at the front of the conversation, despite what, what certain people may feel as to uh, Russia's position. So please keep that on there. Please keep Crimea on the, on the list of things to focus on, but more of the same of this. And thank you to the Atlanta Council for your leadership in pulling this together and the congressional support as well. I, now it's my time to say thank you for being a wonderful audience, and I'd like to thank all of our partners, the American Enterprise Institute, the American Foreign Policy Council, Brookings, Carnegie, Heritage, SEPA, CSIS, GMF, and Jamestown Foundation. Thank you all so much. Let's continue to focus on Ukraine as it is and continue to push. It's a fantastic country, and it can be even more fantastic. Thank you so much for your attendance today.